Perfect. All right. So welcome to Forex Fridays with Deontay. So today's lesson, we're going to talk about a few things tonight. We're going to be talking about weekly range of view, just some overall census of what this week has done. We're going to look at IFTA level observations. We're going to be talking about filter pair selection. And then we're going to be finally talking about premium versus discount monthly. So I really want to dial that in and understanding how premium and discount works. So let's start off with our weekly range review. So first things first, we're going to be starting off with UJ. And as we can see, we have the opening price here. Now this opening price, I always tell traders all the time, is very influential to where the price action is most likely going to push towards because it's fair value. So this is the start of the week. And anything above it is going to be a premium and anything below it is going to be a discount. Now, for those that are familiar with the idea, when price is in a premium, and I'm going to start asking some questions. And if you guys are, you know, attentively watching, you can type in the chat to answer the question. So I'm going to ask a few questions this, this session tonight. When price is in a premium, what is that ideal for? So if anybody can answer that question in the chat for me, what is that ideal for when you're in a premium? If I can get back to the chat. There we go. There you go. So we had someone that said sell. It's ideal for sell opportunities. So let's write that down. So sell, it's ideal for sales. And then that would mean vice versa. Being in a discount, so down here, that would be ideal for what? Anybody can answer. Don't be shy. Even if you get the even if you get the question wrong, don't be shy because we're all just here to learn. Exactly, we're here for a buy, a buy setup. So it's ideal like trading view updated how they set the fonts and stuff and I didn't get the memo so it's ideal for buys now this is a general census of almost everything in the marketplace this applies to the daily open the weekly open the monthly open the yearly open the sessions themselves so the kill zones themselves the opening price of the sessions the opening price to the year, the opening price to any candle. It doesn't matter what candle it is on any time frame. You're going to see this ideology be a fractal idea on top on all time frames. So just looking at the market in its general census, let's get rid of all the trading events. I want to keep it really clean. Sunday. If you don't have Sunday, use Monday. Monday's opening price. So it's always going to be Sunday. So here you see on trading view. That's a good question. 1700 right there. Sunday's opening price. That's the start of the weekly candle. When that weekly candle finally pops up on your screen, what time is it? And it's going to be right there. Let's get all the news events off the chart. And looking at this, we can see that Tuesday was a very volatile day. You can see how large it shot down and how large it went right back up. So you got a purge and revert. You can even see Wednesday. It sells off, right? There's some distribution, but it comes back inside that range and then it consolidates through Thursday. Thursday is just back and forth. We had that news event on Thursday and then Friday, we're continuing to push higher, we can see. We are going to notice that price on Tuesday takes out Monday's low. Let's mark that off. Takes out Monday's low. And what's below Monday's low? sell side liquidity very simple areas of liquidity would be residing below the previous daily low and we can see it's also in a formation of a swing low so that swing low has sell side liquidity below it we can see tuesday runs straight down and takes it out and following that going into london session it turns around and it trades back up to monday's high now, I'm not sitting here saying that we would have predicted all these moves that we're going to talk about tonight, but it's just good to observe the movement of price action. I don't want anybody to think that, oh, Deontay is calling all these moves because it's because I'm not and I'm not trading every single pair and I'm not trading every single day. As much as people may think I am, I'm not trading every single day unless it's for Asian session. 
We can see our price purges. So this is that purge and revert ideology. What is happening? It's purging sell side liquidity and reverting back to buy side. So what's available to the price action going into Tuesday, the previous daily high still. We can see London makes the low. Let me turn on the sessions. London makes the low of the day and price rallies right back up. So in this ideal scenario of buying, we have a few characteristics we could blend together. We can have price going below the Asian session low. So let's bring it back to this day. And we can see how Asian sessions here, London pulls us all the way down. We're right before London. I know there's some debate and a little confusion about what time people start their London session. Now, you can start your London session at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. That 1 a.m. is normally for daylight savings, that hour, right? That extra hour when the clocks go back. That extra hour, you can use that as your open as well as a London session. I personally use 2 a.m. Now, how do we decide which one to pick? That's totally up to you. I can't make that call for you as a trader. If you want to use 1 a.m., use 1 a.m. If you want to use 2 a.m., use 2 a.m. Are there going to be different advantages or disadvantages? I don't think so, relatively. I think either or would be well suited for the opening price for London session. Price comes down, takes out the Asian session low. You can see accumulation. There goes the manipulation going into London, and then price turns around, and New York continues that distribution. So you got your classic AMD here, accumulation, manipulation, distribution. We can see how it hits that high right there. So price is accumulating orders, the characteristics of the Asian session. Then price is unloading itself, getting the retail traders to the wrong side. That's the whole point of it. Retail traders are normally going to start the session. Now, I'm not saying that's how it really is, but when I like to think about it, I like to think about it as as soon as the clock strikes 1 o'clock or as soon as the clock strikes 2 o'clock, everybody is rushing in trying to chase the price action. And that is the easiest way to get these retail traders on the wrong side because they are convinced about the bodies of the candles or the wicks of the candles, right? Whatever that retail logic they're using, they're, they're highly convinced and lure to the wrong side. So they see this large candle down at 1 a.m. You could only imagine somebody with a lack of intelligence of reason, reading price action, they're going to chase this down candle. They're going to chase this down candle. But for those that are really informed, they would know that this is a Larry Williams smash day candle. You would buy at the high of this candle here. So price returns back to that high and it runs higher. That's just a little bonus, you know, for those that are a little advanced and studying the material of Larry Williams. But that would be a smash day candle here because in theory, it looks bearish. And that's the whole point. And I love when retail traders or traders in general say these terms when they tell me, oh, it looks bullish. It looks bearish. When they say that, I know that the market has already convinced them that the market is going to continue going in that direction. That's what they want you to start saying. It looks a certain way. So then you start to believe it's going to happen. And then that's when you get very over optimistic about that direction and you chase price. So everybody chases this large candle. But we don't we don't want to chase large candles. You want to see what happens after this large candle. Most likely a small candle would unfold. Small candle. And we're referring to the body, the size of this candle. Compared to this candle, it's smaller. That's what you would want to see. After this candle, then you would probably seek to look for a opportunity to either go long or short. Because you want the market to be in a small range cycle before getting into a trade. The large range cycle, that is when the excitement has been injected into the market on all time frames. You want to see when that excitement declines and, it's ha and now it has dissipated out of the market then you're waiting for that next injection. You want to be in the market before that next injection. And that's how you're able to capture those large moves and be into profit a lot sooner than later. And you play it forward, you can see a price comes back up here. So that's just a quick overview of AMD and us looking at the weekly range for UJ. But just look at how price, every time it gets above... The weekly opening price, there's most likely a selling opportunity. And look at where all the buying opportunities is unfolding for the month, for the month, for the week below. There's a buy here on Wednesday around 
the end of London close here. So the start of London close, so end of New York session. You can see there's a reversal happening here, a reversal pattern here. London close brings a reversal and continues to push price higher. Thursday consolidation, we did have news. And then we can see Friday continue to go higher. And if I were to turn on this sessions indicator, this is a good tip I like to advise people on. It's something you start to pick up when you start realizing the Asian session is a magnet to the Ipta True Day range. We can see how this Asian session high is left open. But I want you to take a look at every other Asian session this week. Notice it's high and low. Has it been rated? Absolutely. We can see this Asian session high has been broken. This Asian session high has been broken. This Asian session high, sorry, there it is. High has been broken. Deontay, do you only trade the Asian session? Yes, and then I swing trade as well. I talk about how I swing trade. Asian session model and I swing trade. Keep it simple for myself. And we'll, we'll get into all that stuff a little later in the Q&As and stuff, the, the questions and, and my answers later. But, yes, I only do trade the Asian session model intraday. And then we have the Asian session low here broken. We have the Asian session low here broken. The Asian session low here broken as well. Here as well. And notice... There's one thing different about one Asian session this week. This Asian session high was left open. In the near future, and this is something I study, and you could do this yourself. You could back test this, and you could look back and just to see it unfold. Whenever the market leaves a Asian session buy side or sell side liquidity pool open, odds are within the next couple of days or even the following week, it goes back to take it out. You can see how it left this open here on Tuesday. Technically, it's a part of Wednesday's daily candle. But if we look at it like this, it's a part of Tuesday's range. Here, we can see the Asian session high is left open. Could we make an educated guess that in the near future, UJ is going to tag the buy side liquidity above the Asian session high? Absolutely. Notice, every single high and low for this week, Monday, high and low has been rated. Thursdays, high and low has been rated. Friday, high and low has been rated. We have this left open. Odds are the market will come back to that. That's just a little thing I've noticed in price action surrounding the Asian session. There's something about the Asian session and the way the algorithm is programming itself to take out both sides. There's definitely something there. So that's something you guys can study. It's very interesting to see, but let's move on. So now we're going to talk about EU. Let's go down. Now we're going to talk about dollar. Let's jump into dollar. Very similar to UJ as well. Notice where the selling opportunities is occurring. And notice where the buying opportunities are occurring again. Like we said before, one of your fellow traders had said in the chat that you're finding the ideal buy conditions or buy scenarios below the weekly open. How many times do we see price drop below the open and find some type of ground and start to push higher back to the opening price multiple times? So we got one here. Let's let's not even look at Monday. Let's say we're not including Monday. We got one opportunity here, another opportunity here, a little later in the day, going into London close. That London close reversal really strong here on that Wednesday. Here again on Thursday. Here again on Friday. Multiple times there was buying opportunities. One, two, three, four. So there was at least four buying conditions available for retail traders to catch the ideal buy scenario. Notice in the day, it doesn't last long in particular days at least. So Wednesday, Tuesday, and Thursday, these are your ideal trading days of the week. The bulk of the range or the volume is going to come in on these three days here. We could see in each one of those three days, it gave traders, retail traders at least, an opportunity to find the cheapest buy for each one of those days. Here for Tuesday, Tuesday takes up Monday's low. It's the same thing with UJ. Monday's low is taken out. What's below that low? Sell side liquidity. It's now been taken. 
what's available for it now. Buy side liquidity. So price is still, we can see price still went up to seek for higher price action and for those buy stops above those highs. You can even see it's clean. These are clean highs. Even if we weren't looking at the wicks and we were just looking at the bodies of the candle. Settings. Ooh, we want the body. Look at how even if we were to mark it off with just the high here, just the bodies, look how clean those highs are. Same thing here. Look how clean these lows are. So it's a very interesting thing to see them without the wicks too. But you'll notice that price is just aiming for swing lows or clean highs or clean or, or clean lows. Takes out the clean lows here. These are all relatively equal. Yes, they may, they may not be all double bottoms or triple bottoms or quadruple bottoms or whatever the case you may be, whatever count it is. But they're all relatively equal lows. All these. Same thing here. These are all relatively equal highs. Many people would like to call that phantom trend line. Right, they'll draw the trend line. Expect retail traders to try and catch something off of this, you know, buy here, and it finally breaks through, and it continues selling off. You can see how price gets above in a premium on Tuesday, and it finds some type of selling condition here, and it falls down. Not to say I would know what that selling condition is, just a very brief overview. But we can see how at this point, for some reason, whether it is a thirty-minute a four hour, a daily, whatever price point it is that made this price action turn around here because it had to been significant because you see it sells off. Price comes all the way down. When it makes this selling opportunity, where, where is it happening? Below the open or above the open? It's happening above the open, correct. So we could see this ideology again is playing a role in where we could see most likely the odds of a setup. On the premium opportunities grant great sell opportunities. The discount opportunities grant great buy opportunities. So this is another example for DXY. And we're going to move on to EU. Oh, it's GU. So we got GU first. So we're looking at GU. And we're going to be looking at specifically Wednesday too. So this is going to be a good example. I want you guys to pay attention to what I'm talking about here on Wednesday because many people ask me these questions and I feel like I talk about it in these videos and somehow these videos can be long and they, they miss... They either skip over it or they haven't watched it or they've missed a video on the channel. But pay attention to when we start talking about Wednesday, when we go into the intraday here. Look at how price action is trading. Just look at how it's threading the needle. Very sensitive price point. Many people would tell you use Monday's opening price, which isn't a bad price point either. So let's just say we were using Monday's opening price instead of Sunday's opening price. This is Monday's opening price. He opens here, you still kind of get that same effect, right? Price trading around Monday's opening price. You still get that same effect if you were not using Sunday. If you have the opportunity to use Sunday, which we all should have the opportunity to if you're using TradingView, we have Sunday's data, especially in 2024. I think everybody in 2024, their brokers definitely allow them to see that Sunday opening price. And if not, use TradingView to see it. I'm going to use the opening price here. And just to show you, it is the opening price on the weekly. Turn it on. You see that's see the dotted line there? That's the start of the opening price there, the weekly. You can see the open. Look at the yo at the top. I'm going to hover my cruiser there. You can see it there. When I tap it, got the same coordinates. That's the open. 1.2737. Right there. And we can see here, Tuesday does what? Tuesday comes up and takes out Monday's high. So it's inverse to what we just saw for UJ and DXY. <clears throat> UJ and DXY, excuse me. UJ and DXY took out Monday's low on Tuesday. But we can see here vice versa. This is the correlation aspect. I had a comment on one of the videos. Someone said, can you speak a little bit more about the correlations in pairs? And UJ and dollar are directly correlated. If dollar goes up, UJ goes up. If dollar goes down, UJ goes down. That's the general census to its correlation in code. Now, when it comes to the foreign exchange currencies, like the euro dollars, so we're talking about British pound, euro, 
New Zealand dollar. Um, what else we got? Australian dollar. Those majors are inverse to the dollar pairs. So UCAD, U Swissy, and UJ, completely opposite. You can see it's doing the complete inverse to what UJ did and DXY did. DXY came down and took out Monday's low. But you can see here inverse, GU is coming up and taking out Monday's high. Now, that's a simple way to read the correlation. You want to see those markets breaking highs and breaking lows simultaneously, almost within the same time period or the same, you know, quadrant. You don't want to see them doing opposite things. So if they were both going high, let's say GU and UJ was breaking a high. We know that's a crack in code and we have an S&T on our hand. They should not both be breaking highs together. One of them needs to be breaking a low while the other is breaking a high and vice versa. That's how you know something is going on in the market. The commercials are either holding up one, one side of the currency or they're increasing or decreasing net longs or net shorts. And they're physically manipulating the price action from doing what it's not supposed to do naturally. So price comes up, takes out the high. And where does it aim after that? Comes down, takes out sell side. It's a very simple idea. Purge, revert. And you're going to see this concept a lot because that's all the markets are programmed to do. It's chasing liquidity. It's trying to create liquidity and it's trying to take liquidity. So in that method of taking out this swing high, it created a liquidity pool. Where is it? Tuesday high. While taking out, ooh, that's not the high. We can see the high of the day comes in literally at 2 a.m. 2 a.m. is the high on Tuesday during London session. And price sells off and creates a new liquidity pool, a new buy side liquidity pool. And then price comes down and takes out the sell side liquidity. And it also does what? It creates another new sell side liquidity pool. So the markets are primed and coded to take liquidity and make liquidity. Very basic concepts of the market. You're going to see it every single time, no matter in what way you look at it. It looks just like the Asian session model, right? It looks like if we were, if those that are familiar with the Asian session model, looks like the same thing, right? Take out, the sw take out a swing high. Some type of selling opportunity occurs here on the lower time frame. You find a short to target what? The south side liquidity below the swing lows, right? Swing low here, swing low here. Price comes down. Takes out the sell side liquidity. Now we're going to look at Wednesday. Now we're going to jump over to Wednesday. Now we're going to specifically be talking about Wednesday New York session. So this is the New York session model. The same way that you guys know me for the Asian session model, there's also a New York session model. And there's also a London session model. But we're going to talk about the New York session model first. Then we'll get into a London session model example as well. So we're going to look at one for each. So looking at Wednesday, go down to 15 minute. We're going to bring it back to Wednesday. And we're going to turn on our sessions indicator. There we go. I don't really like the sessions indicator. I like my other one, but for some reason, I don't know. For some reason, it's like coded funny. My laptop does some funny things with it. I'll try it again, but I don't. I, I personally don't like this indicator. I like the ones where it hugs the candles a lot more cleaner. But we can see here, we have the New York session here. And right before the New York session ends, after giving this leg up again, it drops down. And after that drop, it continues all the way down into the Asian session throughout that late PM session as well. But how does this sell opportunity unfold? Let's take a look. So price is currently above the weekly opening price. So let's mark that off. We got the weekly open here. And price is above it going into New York session. So while it's going into New York session, we'll bring it back right before it starts. Prices above New York session. Now, disregard what we see here in London and Asia. We're primarily just focus on New York. I know we can look back and analyze those things too, but I want you to direct focus on New York session. That's it. Don't worry about Asian session low or the Asian session high. 
or what happened in London, I just want to bring your attention to New York session. We're above the weekly opening price. Great. What does that mean? We're overbrought. We're in a premium condition via weekly. We're above the weekly candles open at this point on Wednesday, go into New York session. We can also now see we have a liquidity pool between 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. So let's mark that off. So we have 5 a.m. right here. I'm going to call that just our buy side liquidity. And then at 7 a.m., notice we have no swing lows here. No swing low. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take the lowest low I have here via 15-minute time frame on 7 a.m. on the 15-minute time frame. So right here. So I'm taking that. Let's go over to 10. So I'm taking the lowest low at the end of that session. And this session is called what? The London Lunch to 7 a.m. That's a dead zone. You shouldn't be trading here at all. You should be either holding trades that you got prior to this session or you're looking to scale out at this time period because you know that what can occur in this time period as a condition or a characteristic, a deep retracement or potentially a reversal or even a consolidation and even sometimes a continuation pattern as well. But because that market gives too many different variables, I opt to leave it alone, especially because it gives me a phase of consolidation. I don't want to trade the consolidation phase. I don't want to ever roll the dice. And this session for this day happens to land on the consolidation phase. It would have me really frustrated because price isn't doing anything. So I would completely opt out of trading from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. I only want to trade inside the kill zones. So as soon as New York session starts, I have my liquidity pools. We got sell side here, sell side liquidity. Like I said, we took 7 a.m. because there's no swing low we have available that's unbroken. All the swing lows that did form in here, and we didn't even get one at all. Yeah, we didn't get a single swing low. So what are we going to do? We're going to take this swing low. I'm sorry, this this low, which is sell side liquidity. We also have this swing high here, which is what? Buy side as well. So we have buy side here. So we have two buy side liquidity pools, and we got one sell side liquidity pool. And this is 10 a.m. And this is 7. There we go. So we can take all these off now. And I want to see it on the chart. There we go. So we got the London, and then we got the New York session. And we're trading on a Wednesday, which is an ideal trading day. So there's a lot of things that I'm lining up here. I don't mention these things for no reason because these things do make a difference in your trading. They're very subtle things that you're adding, adding to give you more confirmation and more confluence. It gives you better odds. On your side. Still risk though. Because you still can find a losing trade. And the setup can still fa fail. You just want to put probabilities. As much on your side as possible. Price comes. Opens at 7am here. So we mark out the 7am opening price. Mark it off. Here. So this is New York open. And what are we going to do with this as well? The same concept. Anything above it's a premium. Anything below it's a discount. So you can see how this idea is still fractal. It's still fractal. Then we can also take, as an addition, midnight opening price. So we draw this out. We make the line more visible. So this, this darker line here, that's midnight opening price. And that same thing can apply here. So that's if the true day open at 12 a.m. noon, New York Eastern Standard Time, Price is now above that as well. So it's above the weekly open. It's above midnight opening price. And we're waiting for a sell opportunity. Because but I'm, I'm jumping ahead. I'm already jumping ahead in my lesson here. Let me slow down. 
price takes out the sell side liquidity here. But if we're looking for a sell opportunity, we would prefer price to sell above the New York open. We don't want to sell below the session's opening price. We want to sell above. Monster. Yeah, this just threw me off. I'm sorry, guys. But I don't understand the logic here. If DXY gets stronger, should all other peers go down? Shouldn't go down? But if I but I don't I gotta answer these questions after. Um we'll talk about the correlation later. Buy side liquidity is here. Buy side liquidity is here. It just took out sell side liquidity. But if we're looking for a short because of the idea of being above in a premium, being overbought for the week and the day that we're trading on, we also want to have that confluence above the opening price as well. So we want to see price get back above the open. So let's see what happens. So price takes out the sell side liquidity. We'll play it forward. It finds a way to get back up to what? Buy side liquidity. So it purged sell side and it reverted back to buy side liquidity. At this point, it raids a 15-minute swing high. We also have one here. Make that red. Buy side liquidity is ra rated. Now, at this point, if we're looking for a short, we should be hunting for shorts now. Why? Because we're taking out liquidity pools, and we're in a premium for the week, for the day, and the session. So multiple confluence here. We got a triple confluence. Premium for the weekly, premium for the day, and premium for the session. Now, the cause and effect that's happening here is we're rating buy side liquidity. And we know if the market is going to trend, it's only two ways. This is intellectual reading here. Two ways the market can start trending. It's going to fail to break a high or it's going to break a high then sell. Don't let that go over your head because this is where the intelligence comes in. This is where the IQ starts to come in. There are only two scenarios. Think about this. There are only two scenarios. There's not three. There's not four and there's not five. There's only two scenarios for a bearish trend to unfold. The two scenarios are price fails to break a high and goes lower or price breaks a high and then goes lower. Don't let that go over your head. It's a very simple concept. We broke buy side here. At this point, what would I do? Can I say it again? Yes, no problem. There are only two ways in a bearish trend, right, for a market to start trending bearish. What are those two ways a bearish trend can unfold? The first scenario, price fails to break a high and then it trades lower. That's one scenario. What's the second scenario for a bearish trend to unfold? Price breaks a high, then it sells. I love to catch the scenario when price breaks a high, then sells. I'm trying to catch the false break. Now you see where I'm going with this now. You have to pick your poison. Are you going to be a turtle soup trader, a false break trader, or you're going to be the trader that looks to find the mitigation block? Or is a trader that's going to look to see price fail to break a high and then continue to go lower? You got to see what side you would like to prefer. You guys know already that I prefer to be counterparty to those that like to break out. So, for instance, in this scenario, price is breaking swing highs. What do you think retail traders are doing at this point? Anybody in the chat can answer this. What do you think, as price is printing these green candles up like this, what do you think is going through the minds of retail, retail traders? Exactly, Monster. They're chasing price. They're chasing price. Exactly. Correct. They're buying. They're all buying. They're looking to buy. But I don't want to do that. I'm patiently waiting to see if I can be counterparty to those traders that want to buy at a premium. Notice as well, what are these traders doing? They're buying at higher expenses, higher prices. It's much more expensive. Logically, that doesn't make sense in the ideal condition. Everybody gets confused when I tell them, oh, you shouldn't be buying in a premium. And we'll talk about this at the end. But there are times where you are forced to buy at a premium when the market is trending. You can't you can't get away from it because the market's going to trend up and it's going to leave that discount price. And you're going to be forced to buy at a higher price. But if you have the speculation of being counterparty to somebody, especially if they're buying, you're going to look to sell at a higher price. You want them to buy 
GU from you at this price point. And at any point, price is being above midnight opening price, weekly opening price, and even the sessions opening price, and you're a seller, you want the price action to go higher. You want the candles to move higher because you want to now sell it to some other trader because for every buyer, there's a seller. And for every seller, there's a buyer. That's how it works. This market is not one-sided. It can't just be all buyers because if it's all buyers, who are they? Who are the buyers getting it from? They're getting it from a seller. In order to buy, someone had to sell it to you. And in order to sell... In order to in, in order in order to sell, somebody has to buy it from you. So that's how it works. There's always a buyer for every seller, and there's always a seller for every buyer. What Deontay is doing, and what other traders as well are doing, they're looking to catch the false break. And the market likes to put people on the wrong side. So at this point, I would be looking for shorts because I'm overbought. So let's scale down to the one minute. And the reason I go down to one minute is just because I prefer the one minute time frame. You can check out the two minute, the three minute, and the five minute. There may be other things going along that are fractal, but I just want to see all the data that's being unfolded here on the one minute. So as we go through, right, look how we dip below. Look at look at how we dip below. We take out that 715 low, right? Because we're on we were on the 15 minute time frame when we marked off that low for the session, the lowest low. So this is that low here. Where is it at? It should be this candle. I don't know why it's over there. See, right? Let's move it down like this. Right there at 7.15. That's the lowest low from the 15-minute time frame that we have. Because we didn't have any swing low, so we just took the lowest low that we got on the 15-minute time frame during that time period. Price runs that. So what happens? It's down below the New York Open. What's below the New York Open? What condition is below the New York New York Open? Is it premium or discount? Anybody can answer that question. Discount, correct. We're in a discount. So just looking at it from hindsight, you see how price gives a good opportunity for traders who were looking to potentially go long below the opening price. Yeah, but in order to catch that, they might have had to frame this idea of a liquidity pool being broken first, and then the market starts to trend. Remember earlier, I just said trending environments only unfold in two scenarios, and we talked about it in the bearish stance. Let's talk about it in the bullish stance. Those two scenarios, it's just vice versa. Everything is just reverse to what I'm saying. And those two scenarios, when it comes to a bullish trend, there are only two ways it unfolds. It fails, listen carefully, it fails to break a low and then it goes higher. That's our classic ICT mitigation, right? It fails to break a low and then price trades up higher, breaking that lower swing high that it formed or that higher swing high that it formed and continue to trade higher. The other scenario is price breaks a low and then it goes higher. Now, you guys know I like to take counterparty to those that like to sell on a breakout. So if I was going counter to all the buy, all the sellers, what would I have done? I would have waited for a liquidity pool to be broken for traders to think, oh, it broke this low. Oh, it broke this swing low. I should be selling. But in fact, in some case scenarios, they can be right. I don't want to sit here and discredit retail traders altogether. Because we know there are retail traders out there that do win, that use these ideas. But the consistency might not be there as other people that are using counterparty ideas or using other methodologies or ideologies that we are informed about now via ICT, via Larry Williams, via other traders in the community. Most of those retail patterns tend to be inconsistent with what the market is going to print us in certain phases. So retail traders are going short, but what what should we do if we were taking the stance of, of wanting to be counter to that? We should buy it. Yes, yeah, sell it to me. I want you to sell GU to me at the lower price so that I can buy it at a cheaper price because I know within the next hour, the next 10 minutes, 
The next 20 minutes, I know it's going to increase in value. The next 30 minutes, the next four hours, I know that this, this price point that I'm buying it at, it's going to be worth much more in the next couple hours. That's why we're buying. That's the whole point. So you can see how it buys there. In hindsight, we can see how that works there. Now price comes up and takes out what? This buy side liquidity here. Let's run it back here. Right when we run it over. Price takes it out. Let me take my hoodie off. I'm getting hot. Whew. So price takes out that buy side liquidity. And if we're looking to be counterparty here, this is when we start to hunt the setup, right? This is when you become the, the Jaguar, you know, the Leopard, the Tiger, whatever the case may be. You're looking to be that apex predator. You're looking to hunt the gazelle down, the zebra down, whatever it is that you're hunting down, the deer down. You're waiting for that setup to, to form the best opportunity possible. So we're already in a good condition for sales at this point. When price gets right above the premium level and then breaks a 15-minute swing high, you have conditions start to slowly formulate for you. It's starting to show itself. But we need to wait for an entry technique. So let's see. We're normally going to wait for what? Either a fair value gap that breaks a swing low, or we're going to be looking for some type of smash day candle ideology. And if we have any, I'll mark it off here. And we're either going to be looking for a mitigation, potentially, we're going to be looking for a breaker, potentially, a volume imbalance, a gap, if even, you know, all this to the downside, and we'll see what happens. So here, we have no no idea yet. So here, this could have been a idea for a Larry Williams smash day candle, because this candle closes above all these highs, and price returns back to a slow. So that could have been an opportunity there for price to turn around. We can see price comes right back up. And it, this would have been a stopped scenario here, right? We would have been stopped out here. But we're going to keep playing it out and see when that turning point occurs. So do we get, and I'm looking for my specific entry, that fair value gap that's breaking a swing low. So we're looking for it. We don't have any yet. Let's zoom in because I'm blind. We don't have anything yet like that, right? No fair value gaps here. We have a fair value gap here. Think about this. We do have a fair value gap here. We had one here too. Look at that. We had one here. Does it support price? And when I mean support, does it? I mean, does it respect price correction? Does it respect price? No, it does not. Completely runs right through it. So that's a fair value gap I personally wouldn't take, even though we have that balanced price range. So you even have a fair value gap here, another one here. You have another one down. And another one down. So you have four fair value gaps, two going up and two going down. It's balanced for sure, but notice price doesn't respect it here. I don't prefer this entry. Maybe other times it may be suitable, but in this example, it was not. We don't take that fair value gap, doesn't hold up. Let's find another fair value gap that's to the downside. We have one here. You have a fair value gap here. Price even trades into it. It gets a strong reaction down. So that could have been an opportunity. But does that opportunity last long? Let's see. Let's keep playing it out. It doesn't. It continues to pull you back into drawdown or wherever your stop loss is. And then we finally get back up to that buy side liquidity up here. Now, we also have relatively equal highs on the left side outside of the lunch session. So this is the London high. So the high of the day is still in play and intact. That's London session. It's, just four, it's around 450. Right, 4.53, between 5 a.m. to 4, 4.50. You got the high today there. So price could still easily run over that high as well because it's still close to this buy side liquidity. It's all relatively equal. Just because price gets to this specific price point doesn't mean it has to stop there on the dime and turn around. That's not how it works. If the market is ready, it's going to change price. If it's not ready, it's going to continue to target liquidity until it has those orders booked up ready to change and let's keep playing it forward zoom back in do we have any fair value gap broken with a swing low no we also have a balanced price range again again here we go that whole concept everybody loves this concept but i personally don't use it 
not knocking anybody, but look, we have that balanced price range, a fair value gap up and a fair value gap down. So this is rebalance. And in theory, what would this be signs of trapping sellers? Because everybody sees these large candles going up, 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 up. And then it traps them back down. It traps them buying at a very high. You can even see classic IC, ICT, sorry, classic Larry Williams smash the candle. This candle, its close is physically above several highs, many highs. Look at where it is. So what does this look like? It looks bullish, right? That's what I love when I hear traders say that because I know they're chasing price. I love when, when traders tell me that, I know they most likely just are convinced by the market or they're about to be convinced and be overly optimistic about chasing these candles up. It looks bullish. That's what Larry Williams said in his book. This candle, it looks bullish. This one too. This one too. This one too. This one too. But if price were to get back down to its low, you could catch a lot of traders off guard. Because after this candle forms, and this is the one minute candle, let's say everybody's waiting for this candle to close and then they're going to buy the next candle. Let's see what happens when they buy the next candle. It sells. And they're still optimistic, of course, because they look at this candle saying, it looks bullish. It looks bullish. Got to think about the mental psychology behind it and how the candles are convincing people to the wrong side. Boom. Larry Williams will tell you, this is your entry here. You would go short. He didn't place a stop loss in the book. Like I said, I can't relay all the information to you out of the book because I read the book over once in a while to read a couple chapters to get familiar with certain models and find examples. This is one that was very simple. And he didn't give any parameters based on stop loss or take profit. Some of them were like day targets, like hold the trade for, because he was talking about this concept on a daily time frame. And I'm just here showing you it's a fractal idea on the one minute. It doesn't matter what time frame. But it's easy to learn these ideas on the daily because it's a larger portion of data that you're seeing. When you go down to the lower time frame, it's a little harder to see those models. That's why it's easy to learn all the models via daily, via four hour, via weekly, monthly, even yearly chart, because it's easier to find these ideas on the higher time frame and then to see how they're fractal on the lower time frame. So the same thing I'm showing you here can be shown on a daily candle. Imagine this is as a daily candle that came all the way up and closed so high. And then the next couple of days, price comes back down to the daily low and then a new trend unfolds or a new selling opportunity is revealed. And we can see how price does sell off from that low. So it really catches a lot of traders off guard, right? And it pulls those traders that were buying at the highs, buying at the highs, catches them completely off, off guard and puts them underwater, puts them in drawdown now. They're drowning in drawdown. And in that stance too, what does that make people do? I want you to understand there's so many paradigms to this. There's so many different ways another person is – visualizing and thinking about it. And I love to think about it this way. I love to think about every case scenario of how a trader is thinking when they are in that trade long. So think about when they're in the trade long like this and they went buying. And then it comes down and it puts them in drawdown. What do you think is happening to that trader's mind as they're getting into drawdown after buying so high? Anybody in the chat can answer this. Just give me a simple answer. What do you think is happening to that trader when they went buying up here and price comes down below their entry and their drawdown, what do you think starts to happen in their mind? Sweating. That's that's a good that's a good answer. A physiological response. Panic, of course, absolutely. Good answer. There's one answer. You guys are definitely you guys are hitting home. Right? You're hitting right around revenge trading. Absolutely. Those are great answer. But there's one answer I'm looking for. What do you think they're doing? They want to hold. Yes, that's another great answer. They're adding to positions, correct? Yes, these are also these are also other scenarios as well. This is great. You guys are actually you guys are thinking. These are very critical thinking skills here. Now, the one I was thinking of, and you guys are all right. They get nervous to think of come back. Keep putting. Yep. Good right. That's a good answer. Move their stop loss. Yes, they yep. Yeah, they will do that as well. Correct. See, these are all scenarios. A lot of traders do things differently, but we all have things in common. It's pretty similar. 
when you start to look at all the traders, you know, like let's say we had a controlled versus experimental group, right? And we put, um, we looked at the experiment. We had a control group, and we told them that hey, you only buy like this, you only sell like this. That's it, and you can't move your stop loss. You can't revenge trade. You can only take one trade. But then we look at the experimental group, and we allow them to run free with their trading. And everything you guys said is exactly what we would see those people doing. They would do those exact same things. It would open up their, their stop loss even larger in hopes of the trade is going to go back long or the trade is going to go back into break even or wherever I, um, where my entry is so that I'm not in drawdown. They're going to revenge trade like someone else said. They're going to keep adding positions. Correct. They're going to keep adding positions because they really and truly believe the market is going to go up. Ta, they start praying to ICT. Ah, he won't help you. He ain't going to pay your bills, man. But enough joking. The scenario that I wanted to, 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 to get across is, the one that somebody didn't say, is they switched to being bearish. Right? That's another scenario. So everybody was long, but then they start to lose. And their mind does what? You know what? Let me switch to being bearish. Right? Let me switch. That's, that's the one that killed me. I'm, and the reason I'm pointing this one out is because I was really a victim of this. I would chase price long, right, in my earlier careers because I wouldn't understand. I'm just chasing the price. I see it going up, so let me just buy. But as soon as I buy, it starts going down. So what do I do? I close my buys out, and I immediately go short. And then as soon as I go short, guess what happens again? It goes long again. It's like the market is truly against me, and it's as if the market makers are right over my shoulder or they have a camera in the room. And they're watching and waiting to see when Deontay clicks by. As soon as he clicks by, oh, we're gonna sell. As soon as he gets out his sell and he he clicks by and he and he and he uh as soon as he clicks um buy, sorry, I'm getting myself confused. As soon as he clicks sell, we're gonna buy now. The market makers are gonna buy. So it's almost as if you're losing every single time. The only reason that this happens is because people are too naive in chasing the candles when it's more than just the candles. Just because you see up candles does not mean the market will remain in that bullish trend for a long time. And most people are short-term traders anyways. I don't know a lot of swing traders or position traders. The average people, the average trader is a day trader or some type of scalper. So they're in and out of positions very frequently throughout the day. They're taking 20 trades, 50 trades, 60 trades, 100 trades a day. And if you were to look at their score on how qu the quality of those trades – a lot of them would be emotional trades. They, they're not set, sat behind sound logic at all. They're just taking trades based off emotions or just based on pure direction of where they see the candles closing. That's not how it works because you can get yourself hurt like this. You just see it going up and then it smashes right through. That's why Larry Williams calls it a smash, a smash candle because the candle smashes all the buyers it puts them in drawdown. Everybody that starts buying at the high, oh, that's so unfortunate for them. And it really feels like the market is against them. But like I said, that person would, that, that other scenario is that person might flip from being a buyer to then being a seller. And that's one, that's another scenario. And I was, I was a victim of that. I did that a lot, which is why you got to be careful and don't be quick and hasty to jump into positions just because you see it flying. That's FOMO. We don't care about FOMO because there's going to be thousands of other opportunities, whether that's today, the next session, the next kill zone, the next day, the next week. There's going to be an opportunity for you that's much better than you just being so gullible in the short term. And after that, we can see, look, what happens? It buys right back up, right? Look at that. Look at how the market just plays you. You went to go buy, then it sold. So then you went to go sell. Then it buyed against you again. Then you went to go buy again, and then it sold again. Then you sold, and then you went to go buy again. And what you think happens again? It sells again. Of course it does. Of course it does. So let's keep playing it out. And I think shortly you're going to see my entry technique. There it is. It finally appears. It took a long time for it to appear, though, right? This specific formation right here. Fair value gap. Swing low broken. It took a very long time for that to happen. Got to be patient for it. That whole time we were stalking it. 
We were stalking it from the first time it broke that 15-minute swing high. We were stalking it from this point here. So around 8 o'clock, 8.06, we were waiting for this entry to unfold. It didn't unfold until almost an hour and change later. Right, an hour and 30 minutes later, it finally unfolds. So you got to be patient. It happened very later in the session. Sometimes it happens earlier in the session. Sometimes it happens in the middle of the session. Sometimes it happens later in the session. You just have to be the tiger waiting for the gazelle to cross your crosshairs. That's it right there. That's where you take the shot. That's where Deontay would take his shot, personally. Like I said, you don't have to take my entry technique personally, right? You could find some other method that you find to be more suited for you or something that your eyes can, you know, articulate better. Because some people don't see the fair value gap. It's difficult, especially if someone's new to trading ICT. They don't see this formation, how easy I could just, oh, fair value gap. Okay, let's draw it real quick. But that's the formation. At this point, what would I do? What would I do? I would look to go short. But where would I go short, you may ask? I would go short to at least, let's say, a swing low formation. Now, the projections can be anything you want. Just make it reasonable so that you actually have a great risk to reward ratio. Some things are unrealistic at times. But if you can see swing lows here, let's say we're on the one minute. Let's go on the five minute. Let's just go on the five minute, right? What higher time frame, right? Now I'm going up in time frame to find liquidity pools. What higher time frames? Liquidity pools that we have if we're going to take this short. We have this swing low here. Let's just circle it. This swing low. What's below that swing low? Sell side liquidity. What's below these double bottoms here? What's below that? Are they double bottoms? Let me see. Yeah, they are. This is a double bottom. What's below that double bottom? Sell side liquidity. Another swing low. Sell side liquidity. Another one here. Sell side liquidity. Double bottom. Sell side liquidity. So you have projections. Because many people may ask, I don't know where I'm aiming my trade to. Look for the swing points. That's what the market is trying to target. We said it before. The market's primary goal, there's many primary goals, and they're all similar. They're all cousins or relatives or brothers and sisters. They're all similar. They're all one big family. It's all liquidity pools. And it's in the form of swing lows, swing highs, clean highs clean lows. That's what it's in the form of. And it's trying to target that. We can also frame another idea as well. We have the ideology of fair value. This session is coming to an end, but we can see this is fair value, right? This is premium above and this is discount below. But if price were, were to sell, we could at least speculate. This is where I, I tell traders that intellectual thinking, think about that intellectual thinking, that forecast, what could you predict could happen if you were to sell? We could potentially get back to the New York Open. That's another projection level. And it's reasonable. And it's logical. We see it happen all the time. It's a logical area of interest. We will be going into the London close. And we'll observe that shortly and briefly. But you can see how we have projections from the one-minute entry to the five-minute liquidity pools. Even if we were to go back on the 15-minute time frame. What do we have on the 15 minute time frame? We have, let's see, is this a swing low? No, these are clean lows. So we have clean lows here. Double bottom. We love to sell through that. We don't look at the double bottom as what? Support. We're not looking at the double bottom as support. I don't believe in support and resistance in my in my model. It's just not in my trading plan. I don't even I don't use support. I don't use su supply and demand. Support and resistance. I don't use that. I use specific levels of highs and lows. Swing highs, swing lows, clean lows, clean lows, clean highs. Same thing here. Double bottom. I want to sell through that. Too clean. Too clean. So let's go back to the one minute time frame. Let's look at the entry. Once again, get familiar with this. This is the sell entry. We rated what? A 15 minute. Swing high. What is that? Buy side liquidity. BSL. That's what's been rated. That 15 minute swing high. Then we get this. After breaking that swing high, we get this. I'm not saying that it had to break the highest 
swing high in that dead zone to produce this fair value gap. Because this fair value gap here, the one that we're specifically looking for, it could have formed after breaking this first one here. But it just didn't. It just didn't. So that means we have to keep waiting. In the process of waiting, it happened to keep going up and breaking more liquidity levels. So this one here, it could have happened here as well, but it didn't. It continued to trade higher. It finally got this one, and it took a while. And then finally un it unfolded. How would I trade this? Very simple parameters. You could tweak it to your liking. I'm going to go for a one-to-one -one scenario, guys. Oops. Remember, somebody told me, Deontay, you're wasting your time. Just do it like this. So we're going to go 15 pips. 15 pips. There we go. 15 for 15. Oh, one to one. You're risking a dollar to gain a dollar. So let's say in this trade idea, let's say in this trade idea, I have an account that is $10,000. And I'm risking 1% on this trade based on the lot size. 1% of 10 grand is equal to $100. Very simple numbers here. I'm not trying to overcomplicate it. So if I win this trade, what, what happens? I win. If I win, I gain $100. If I lose, I lose $100. See how simple I was able to put that together? So let's see what happens. So price trades into the fair value gap multiple times. Let's play it through. And there we go. You would have gained a hundred dollars off of that move, right there. And look at how quickly it gets right back down. It's trying to get where back to fair value. New York session hasn't ended yet because we still have a couple more minutes to ten o'clock here. But notice in this idea that I showed you, very simple idea. I don't over speculate the market. I don't over analyze it. Is this setup going to form every single day? Yes and no. Let's be truthful about it. Yes, it is forming every single day. However, it may not be forming on the pair that you selected to focus on that trading day. That's the whole, that's a whole nother, a whole nother ball game here. Because you may be only tracking two pairs that you want to look at for the day. Let's say you're only looking at EU. EU doesn't give the setup that we're talking about here, but GU did. So you happen to miss it. It's the same thing when I talk about the Asian session model with UJ. I'm looking at UJ. Some days UJ gives the model. Some days it doesn't. But then the other yen crosses, when UJ doesn't, it does give the model. So it all depends on the pair that you're looking at. So if you have a basket of pairs, you can shuffle around and look at it and to see. But at some point in time, you will need to specify what pairs you're going to specifically trade. And at times, it's the luck of the draw, you know? It's the luck of the draw. Let's say this, because like I said, so many ways this could unfold. GU gives the setup and EU gives the setup. But instead, GU hits stop loss. But EU gives the same setup and it wins. So it's the luck of the draw. Sometimes you pick the pair that happened to not be the one that was going to be set out to win that day. You can't win everything. You just can't. And like I said, it's just a, it's just a pair that you picked that day. It's the card you pulled out of the deck and you happen to focus on that day. Or it's the one that happened to show the setup first. And for some reason, this setup showed first before EU and it still failed. And then EU shows the setup and it wins. So then you're upset. This is what you sign up for, guys. There's a lot of variables to it. I know it's difficult, but there's a lot. You got to keep it simple. But if you stay to it consistently over and over again, you look for the same model over and over again. Over and over again, eventually you're going to start to see a streak of wins. Eventually you're going to get more niched in what you're specifically looking for because you have that discipline. You've got that model. Nobody can tell you different. This is it. I ain't trading nothing else. I'm only trading. That's why I said I ain't trading AU. I mean, sorry, I'm not trading AJ. I'm not trading CAD J. I'm not trading Swiss J. I'm not trading New Zealand versus Japanese yen. I'm not trading any of the other yen crosses. The Asian session library has only been on UJ. And notice how consistent I am with it. No matter how many times people say, no matter how many times people tell me, yo, you could be trading. I seen the setup in gold today. 
I seen the setup in AU today. I seen the setup in GU today. I don't let that falter me. I don't start to get optimistic and say, oh my gosh, it works on other pairs. I should be, I should be maximizing the model and using it on every single pair. No, I should not be. I should be keeping it as simple as possible. That's why UJ is my bread and butter. A lot of people don't trade UJ, but I figured out a way to utilize UJ, day trading at least, with the Asian session model. It's the same thing here that I showed. So you see this trade wins? What happens when you win this trade? You now go from what? 1% up in your account. Just off of one trade idea. Done. But then you start to realize people have poor risk management, which is why they blow through equity so fast. Instead of risking, let's say, 1%, some people are out here risking 5%. Some people are out here risking 6%, some ludicrous numbers. And you'll slow, you start to see how quickly people lose live funds, how they fail prop challenges, how they blow their funded account. You see how quickly they lose the accounts just off of the angle of risking way too much per trade. It's the small wins. You can start to get a little, you know, aggressive. When you start getting on a hot streak, right? Let's say you get two winning trades back to back. For instance, let's see if I have it up here. For instance, let's say Tuesday and Wednesday, Asian session model, right? It's been it's been outstanding. This model, this this month has been outstanding for you, Jay. Let's say I take two win back to back wins here, right? And I risk one percent per trade. So I gain one percent. Let's say let's say ten pips is half percent. So half a percent here, and you can see you gain way more than 1% because it trades more than 15%, 15 pips. But let's say 10 pips is half a percent of equity gained. So 10 pips, congrats. We got that. Another 10 pips in the next the next day, we got that. So that's 1%. Now, if I'm feeling, you know, that I have the edge, I'm in my trading zone now. I know exactly what I'm looking for. I can that next day increase the risk to 1% per trade. Instead of risking half a percent per trade, let's say I, I turn it up to 1% and I actually win. You're like, oh, wow. And that's a great opportunity. But as soon as you take that loser, that's when you need to check your risk again. You need to lower your risk by half. And if you lose that again, you, you lower that by another quarter and, you, and so on and so forth to the point where you possibly probably can't lower your risk anymore and you're trading with micro lots. And you have to regain that. You have to regain that um, ground with your risk to reward. And let's jump back to GU. But this is a simple idea. Simple idea. Where are we selling as well? I want somebody to answer that in the chat. Where are we selling? Where does this sell opportunity occur? Any any answer that you that comes to mind? Where is this sell opportunity happening? Anybody can type it out. Premium. Bingo. It's happening in a premium. Notice the selection of trade. Look, I had to wait. Think about that. There's patience here. I had to wait hours for this to unfold. Day trading is not for everybody. Because if you don't have the time to do this, you can't sit here and stalk this setup. You just can't. You literally can't. That's what I said. You got to make time for the kill zone. If you don't have time to kill, trade that kill zone from start to end, you need to read the side what kill zone you're trading. Because if you have work, right, let's say you're a desk jockey, you know, and you work a nine to five corporate job and you, you're at your desk, you, most times they're not, mostly every single time, you're going to be still in company hour, right? And your manager or your, your supervisor, whoever who's managing you, isn't going to like that you're on trading view on their laptop, on their company time, and you're getting paid to trade while working there. No, you're there to make money for that company. Right. And and perform whatever skill and duty your supervisor or manager or boss told you to do. So if you can't sit here and trade 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., how do you think you're going to be able to opt to, to capitalize on catching something like this? You're not. Because you're most likely going to sit here, you're on, you're on your computer, you're at work and you're going to probably chase something along the lines here. Something's going to get, foster you, you know, and plus you're either dealing with clients at work. You're dealing with emails at work, phone calls at work. You're talking to other coworkers. You just can't do it. You just can't do it. So it's it's bigger than getting onto the charts. You see how it's 
it's not even it's not even getting to the chart first. It's do you even have time to get to this chart? Some people don't have the time, which is why you see me mainly focusing on age and session model. That's when I have time. I have things I got to take care of. I've got farmland to take care of. I got content to make. I got to answer DMs. I got to answer questions on YouTube. I got to answer this. I got to teach people that I got to teach family members how to trade because that's a goal of mine, you know? I got to teach my girlfriend how to trade because that's another goal of mine. So I have to make time for those things. I don't have time throughout the day to, to trade New York, to trade London, especially London because I live in New York. And I, and in New York here, London is where everybody's sleeping. That's right after midnight. I can't trade that. So what is my availability? It's 8 p.m. to midnight. I have that time. And as soon as midnight passes, I'm going straight to bed. Most times I don't go to bed because I'm here trying to help other people around the globe. You know, while I'm going to bed, they're waking up and that's their free time. So I have to kind of there's a given there's a given pull. You know, sometimes I stay up late. So I answer questions for people and have these Zoom calls with you guys. At, at late nights like this. So it's a give and pull, depending on your situation. But you got to be able to be available from the start to the end of the session. This is even before you start trading. What is your life schedule like? What's your day-to-day -day activities? If you don't know that, get it in line. Get it in order. Get it in order. It's crucial. That's crucial before you even touch the chart. Before you start reading price action, you need to tell yourself, can I commit? And if you can't commit, I think you need to reevaluate the time periods that you're trading in. Or you potentially reevaluate the style of trading that you're using. You need to find a model that suits your lifestyle. And for most people, the biggest and general answer is swing trading. Anybody can swing trade. Because especially if you're swing trading on the, the higher time frames and you're risking very small equity, you can have a chance to make something out of the market. So let's move on. So that is GU. So that's the New York session model. So I know everybody asks me, is there a New York session model? Yes, there is one. And I just went over it. Now we're going to get into AU. And after this, we're going to look at IPTA look back data range observations for the month of January. Some of the things that I've been noticing. Same, very choppy week for AU. I want to make sure. Is it AU that I wanted to talk about? No, it wasn't AU. It is EU. Where are you at? There it is. EU. I wanted to talk about EU. And we're going to talk about Tuesday. But just look at how the price action is unfolding. And look at how every time price moves into a premium, there's some type of sell opportunity this week. Every time price moves into a discount, there is some type of buying opportunity this week. Now, we're not going to go over each turning point here when it bought and when it sold, but just look at it in an overall view. It's really nice to see it this way. You can't see it this way until it obviously passes and you look back and you reflect on it. But that's how we start to gain experience. That's how we gain exposure. We need to expose ourselves to these ideas so that when the next week comes along and we're able to take a certain stance, we know how to look for certain setups and when to look for certain setups and what should be unfolding. What's the course of action? Step one, this. Step two, this. Step three, this. Step four, this. Step five, this. Whatever. How many steps it is for your model? And then boom, entry. What are the steps that lead you up to the entry? You got to reverse engineer it. And that's what I like to do. What When that market gives that turning point, how does it do it? Reverse engineer it. Where did it came, Where did it come from? How did it get here and what provided it the sponsorship to trade this way? If you reverse engineer a lot of the things, you're able to see the formation. Step one, step two, step three, entry, profit, or whether, whether you win or lose. But let's take a look at Tuesday. So coming down to Tuesday, I'm going to jump down to the 15-minute time frame. And we're going to mark off the session. So going into London, let's go like this, right before. We have, once again, the weekly opening price. And I'll get to the, the questions a little later because I don't want to just keep stopping. Sometimes it kind of flusters me. You got the weekly open. 
and we can see prices above the weekly open. So we're at a premium for the week. Let's note off the opening price for the Epta True Day open. We got that here. Let's make that more apparent. That's midnight opening price. So we got that acronym, MOP. The same thing for weekly open is the same thing as SOP, SOP, Sunday open. Opening price is interchangeable. Weekly opening price and Sunday opening price is interchangeable because they are the same thing. And then we also have 2 a.m. opening price. Let's draw it out to 5 a.m. It's at the end of the session. Let's draw it out like a little later, maybe to 7. So we also have London opening price. Now let's talk about the kill zone or the dead zone that we have in between London and Asian. So Asian sessions here and London sessions here. So this time period is going, in my theory, in the way what I call it, I call it the Asian session lunch. The reason I call it the Asian session lunch is because it happens after Asian session. So I like to say, oh, this session went on lunch. So it's called the Asian session lunch. So we got the 5 a.m. here. So we're going to do, this is the ooh, trading view. Come on now. This is Asian open. Oops, not Asian open. Asian lunch. This is going to be midnight to 2 a.m. So 2 a.m. is included in the session as well. So there's that little overlap. 2 a.m. is also included in London open. Like I said, I start London session at 2 a.m. If you want to start yours at 1 a.m., so that's preference. It's all up to you. <clears throat> so at this point, I'm looking for my liquidity pools that I have. It's way too far. Let's get this closer. That we have here, just going into 2 a.m. So some liquidity pools that we have. We have this as sell side liquidity. Just simple sell side liquidity SSL, right? I'm gonna go bottom, put it in the middle, bottom center. Sell side liquidity here. We also have another swing low. Let me double check. Yes, this is a pip low. Ooh. This was a pip lower. That's 16. The other one's 17. See there, it's a pip lower. There we go. Get that swing low, and then after that, we don't have. Any other swing lows here available? We have this swing high here. Why am I not taking this swing high? Can somebody answer me that question? Why am I not using this swing high here for buy side liquidity? Thank you. It's already broken. Correct. So I'm not using it. It's already been exhausted. It's been broken. So we're going to completely ignore that. Not to say it can't still be reused as another PD array, right? An old high. Because we could look at this market in many different scenarios and different viewpoints. But it's been broken already, so we're not going to take it. So instead, I'm going to take 2 a.m. on the fifth notice on the 15-minute time frame. I'm not going down to the one-minute time frame and marking off that 2 a.m. candle. I'm marking off on the 15-minute time frame at 2 a.m. where that candle finishes, whatever that high is. I'm taking the highest high of this lunch session at 2 a.m. It's right there. We got the London open here. And we're going to see what happens going forward. So let's trade it forward. You can see price opens here, right there, and it trades past it. It gets above that 2 a.m. open. And it gets above that London lunch, sorry, that Asian lunch high. It runs right past that. Let's mark that off. Buy sign liquidity. <clears throat> Got that buy side, and you can see how immediately price comes down. Let's check on the one minute and see what's going on. So just want to bring it back because I don't want to give the answer right away because I know the higher time frames shows a lot more data than I want it to show sometimes. So we got that candle there. Within that 15-minute candle, that was the highest high. See right here, 15. Price runs through it. <clears throat> price comes down. 
after that candle, right? Price is coming down. What should we be looking for now after breaking this high here? Potentially price making what? A selling opportunity above the opening price, if we could get it on screen. There we go. A selling opportunity. But we really want to get that selling opportunity above the opening price. So thus far, we're above midnight opening price. We're above Sunday's opening price, the smaller dash line here. Sunday's the weekly opening price. Midnight opening price, 12 a.m. And now we're just waiting for price to get above London opening price. Let's see if we can get price back above it. I'm not even quite sure if it does. <clears throat> Play it all the way through. We can see how price gets right back down to sell side quality, even these clean lows. But looking at it, we don't get that ideal sell condition. Now here we have some things to talk about again. We don't get that ideal sell condition, but do you see how traders were forced to sell at a discount? We still have that entry technique. It's hindsight. I wouldn't have taken it because I don't want to sell in a discount. But you can see how traders at one at some point in time to double bottom. Doesn't fully fit the rules of what we're looking for here because it's a double bottom. But you can see how this runs through these clean lows here. Boom. And price trades right back into it. So there's some type of selling opportunity inside this fair value gap. It's black. And then price continues to sell down. And where does it sell? Right back down into sell side liquidity. Right into it. So what's, what's happening here again? Purge revert. It doesn't change. The, the kill zones themselves are doing the same thing. All the kill zones are looking for this similar fashion of pattern. Does this pattern unfold every day? Yes and no. Because it all depends on what pair you're looking at. You may be looking at EU and it worked. But then your buddy over there is looking at GU and it didn't give this setup on Tuesday. This clean PD array, right? The way the market is moving this way, price is going up and then coming down. Great price action. Most times you would want this ideal movement in price because it's very easy to catch the cells and to also scale into those cells, right? Find a way to pyramid the trades even lower. So even though you got one, let's say, like I said, it's not the ideal sell, but it is a sell condition. Granted, this is a sell and a discount. Is there other ways you can pyramid sell this again? Absolutely. Where do we have another fair value up to the downside? Here. Price trades up into it and it sells off again. Right? Instead of taking the lower, this lower swing high. Sorry, this. I thought that was a fair value gap to the upside. My mind is fooling me. I need to zoom in. This fair value gap here, look how price respects it, sells off, and then taps right into sell side liquidity. Now, if we were just looking at it, just to get some numbers on it, some perspective, that's 11 pips. 11 pips. Not hard to get. It's the same idea. Just wasn't the ideal sell condition. But notice, I'm showing you the same ideology. It wasn't exactly what we would want from the model, but it's very similar. Nothing changes. And I want to play it out just to see what else happens. Then it even targets what? The other sell side liquidity. It just keeps trending lower, 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 and lower. And how did this sell opportunity start? How did this bearish trend start? What's that one scenario that I was talking about? Can somebody answer that in the chat for me? How did this scenario start? How did this bearish like start out of the two conditions we talked about? Exactly. There we go. It broke a high. It broke a level of li liquidity pools. It broke a level of buy side liquidity. And then it sold off. The other scenario would be like this. Price comes up, fails to break the high. And then it continues to go. There's a mitigation. 
and then price continues to continue to sell off. And that's what would happen there. Instead, you probably get the breaker, right? Price comes up, comes down, goes right back up into it, and then it sells off. So you got that mitigation or you got that breaker idea. So that's how I love to see and think about how trends unfold. And let's play it out to the end of the session. Let's keep playing until we get to 5 a.m. So you can see how that whole London session was trending. Even though London is now in a discount, notice how it continues to offer sell side. Continues to offer that sell off, that distribution, even though it's below London Open. Because the idea has already been formulated and the market has already made up its mind on where it's going. It's now targeting sell side liquidity. It no longer is seeking to buy cheap. It's not. It will later in some other due time. But in this time period, we could see it already found its best sell up here and then sold off. Selling conditions don't last often. Right? Granted, it's hindsight. But we can see how how long did this premium setup last? Was it long? Was this was that sell opportunity long at all? Right? Granted. No, it was not. It was very short lived. Traders would have had to been on their P's and Q's for this. Because it quickly does it. It does it around in tw twenty minutes into the session. It already said I made the high of the day or the high of the session, and I'm going to sell. If you're not paying attention to su subtle things that are happening here on the lower time frame or things that are happening on some of the higher time frames where you're basing your liquidity pools around, you're not going to pick up on these things. And you're definitely not going to pick up on those things if you don't know daily draw or bias. Now, sometimes these models can be a no bias idea. And sometimes you can formulate this into a bias um, a trend bias idea as well. And it works hand in hand. So if you're looking for a sell, if you're looking for EU to go lower, this is a scenario that you would look to find for that day, that trading day. And if we look at it even further, we're above the Asian session high. We're above the Asian session high. The Asian session low is still intact. Though Asian session was pretty trendy, we can see how London comes up above brings it all the way above the Asian session high and then the ideal sell scenario occurs above Asian session high. These are characteristics you have to start to pick up when trading. On those bearish days, how often do we see price move above the Asian session high then sell? Pretty often. On those bullish days, how often do we see price move below the Asian session low and then run back up? Pretty often. Now it may not be as clean to the the T in the way you may formulate it in your head, but just grasp the concept in your head or the methodology in your head so you understand exactly how to play it out if the chance comes by and you are able to take that shot. So that's our weekly range review. And next topic we're going to talk about is if the observations. If there's any questions, let me know. Let me just go back and check the chat briefly. <clears throat> Excuse me. To make sure I answer some of the questions before I move on. And just scroll up. So can you do USD round the year with very low risk, right? I'm not sure. This person's name is online practice. I'm not sure what you mean by that, my friend. Um about using UJ round the year with very low risk, right? I'm not sure if you're saying, can I trade UJ all year round? Yeah, I can. If I'm only using um, the Asian session model. But I can use it. And this is where expertise comes into play, like the hours you put behind trading. Technically, I can use any pair because if I understand how to read daily bias, I should be able to capitalize on trading. Any comments on gold in general? Um. Right now, it's it, it's it's still teeter tottering. It's just like GU. It's been up high. It's still pretty high, um, and we'll talk about it as we get into the, if the videos. But um, if dollar's gonna rally, of course I'm gonna expect it to go lower. 
if it if it doesn't if gold doesn't go lower, then there's some type of SMT diversion. There's something underlying happening in the market. Then maybe gold take overtakes and rallies, and then EU, GU, NU, all those go back bullish. G uh UCAD, U Swissy, UJ, they all switch back bearish. Uh with this model with gold, it doesn't it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the pair. You see it in gold all the time as well. Not all the time, but you'll see it frequently. Some people can attest to it as well. Um, I'm not going to go looking for one right now, but if you take the time to look back and reflect on it, you'll see the same ideas unfolding as well. Like I said, it doesn't matter the asset class. It doesn't matter the asset class. It could be cryptocurrency. It could be commodities. It could be FX. It could be metals. It could be futures. The market is all manipulated. The market is fake. It's already coded to a certain T. It knows what it wants to do. It's going to do it in a methodical path. There are certain price patterns that are already priced into its commands of ones and zeros and how it unfolds. There's no way of changing that. And I'm not going to try and jump into like the deep end and people like to fear monger and say, oh, the algorithm is going to change in the next couple of years. Or they said, I don't think the algorithm is ever going to change because way before I was even born, the market was trading the way it was before things went, you know, super electronic and wasn't manual trading. But even when I wasn't aware of trading, because I started trading when I got to college five years ago, that doesn't mean that the algorithm was not the same 10, 20 years ago when I was unaware of what trading was. It was exactly the same. The same ideas that we're talking about was happening way before you started trading or was even aware of trading. So I personally don't believe in that. I know there's people in the space in the trading community that's going around telling people that the algorithm is going to change. I don't know. You know, I'm not trying to play, you know, market maker God here because I'm not a market maker. If it changes, it changes and we have to adapt. So what? That's what we do as human beings. Only the strongest survives. If it does change, adapt. Move on. Study the market. Um, but if it doesn't change, then keep crushing it. Keep doing what you know. Keep following that algorithmic code that we see week to week, day to day, month to month, year to year. Now let's jump into IPTA. Just going to take a sip of water. Yeah, it's all hype. People, you see all I see all that nonsense on Twitter and YouTube and stuff. People just trying to sell their course. Yo, I know the algorithm's gonna change, so you better buy my five hundred dollar course. And then on top of that, you gotta pay for signals and get out of here. All right, all right, all right. So if the look back later and just now, this might be something that a lot of people may know me as or first were introduced to me as because I'm someone that posts a lot about it. I post frequently about this idea and I use it pretty frequent. I use it all the time when in, in my trading plan. It's a part of my trading plan. That's a thing. A lot of people, they see that I don't use certain things and they ask me like, yo, you don't use this? I'm like, no. Do you ever see me talk about it? Then I probably most likely don't use it. But if you see me talking about it on a day-to-day -day uh, consistency or a month-to-month -month consistency, that means I, I use it and I really like it and I'm rocking with it. And I've been rocking with IPTA look back data ranges for a very long time. Real knowledge public will never search that. Yeah, of course. It's going to go over a lot of people's heads. Unless you tap in and you figure out, you come across my page, then you'll, then, then you'll know. But if you don't know, you don't know. And I say... And I respect everybody that supports me and I respect everybody that follows me and, and asks us questions and and challenges me to do better and challenges me to be, you know, you know, this 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 leader, you know, kind of not trying to say I'm a leader to anybody, but like try to be motivation for other people and to be a good role model, at least, you know, practice what I preach. I want to show exactly what I'm preaching in these examples every single year, month to month, day to day, session to session. I want to be able to provide that for you guys as well, which is why I do this. I'm tracking the model so that it's not all bluff. I'm not just this random guy that says, yo, this model is this model is 70%, you know, win rate. And I have no data to actually show it. And I have no trades to actually show it. And I'm not taking the trades myself. No, I, I take the trades with you guys and I share it with you on the Telegram channel. I don't want here to be, oh, you made up this model and 
there's some skepticism behind it. I don't want anything to be skeptical. I want you to know that I walk through it with you guys too. I'll hold your hand through the whole process. Step one, step two, step three, entry, and there we go. Win or lose, we still we still believe in the model. Win or lose. And so far, not to sidetrack, this model has been outstanding. Let's just highlight that right now. Out of all the days, and I think I got every single day here, every single Asian day, uh, unless I missed a day. And there's no Asian session here on Friday. I live in New York, so I know that the times or days might be different. But on Friday, there's no Asian session. So it's only it's only Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So that's why you don't see any Fridays here. And out of all the days so far, and I think if I did a good job tracking this, I have to go back and see if I missed any and then put it in here. But I think I have been really consistent and been on top of myself and being disciplined. Only two days were losers. All the rest were winners. So, so far for January, this thing has a pretty high win rate. And I haven't been tracking the model long enough for a full year. I only started tracking this model last year, late. Um, let's say I really started tracking it seriously my birth month, October. And then I started tracking it. And then a lot of things started coming up, started getting land, you know, and um, trying to work something out with a new farm, my business partner and stuff like that. So I wasn't able to be consistently on top of trading and I wasn't able to put out a lot of daily bias. I mean, daily tracking videos last year. That's why you saw there was a lot of inconsistency with me there, but a lot of things in my outside of trading was going on. A lot of people's like, Oh, you're not posting a lot. Cause I'm like, Hey, I actually have a life outside of trading too. You know, I have other things going on and I try to make best of what I can do. And I had to figure out my life schedule so that I can make sure I have time for you guys as well. And for the community, but model overall, only two days hit stop loss. And I want you to think about this. When price hit stop loss, it was only either a 1% risk or 2% risk. Everything else, all the winners were 1%, 1% gains or more. And some of them are unrealized gains. So for instance, not saying that I closed out at 15 pips, but generally I'm telling people take profit to close out the trade at 15 pips. But if you don't take that advice, excuse me, if you don't take that advice and you have a trailing stop and you're trailing your stop loss, you can see how you can potentially reap more benefits into that trade. And the asterisk here just means that this price is still in unrealized gains. So this could be 100, 100 pips. This could be 200 pips. I'm not going to calculate that till the end of the month to see how far the trade went without coming back to hit that stop loss. When I put the max TP, or I mean the max profit, when I wrote all the numbers in, that means price did come back to the original stop loss. So I write that off as the max amount that price went before re returning back to the stop loss so that no one's confused. So you don't know these things unless you actually hear it from me and you actually ask me. Um, But yeah, all these would have just been 1% losers and everything else would have been at least a minimum 1% or let's say even half percent, you know? minimum one half a percent gain and look at how sometimes it trends more than half a percent of 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 returns of RRI. So it's pretty it's pretty outstanding. Not to say next month like February. February may not be give the same results. It should give something similar, but as we track the data for the I, I just can't wait to track the full year so that I can look back and say, okay, we know UJ and this model is very great or has great results during January. Or we know that December, right, or whatever month, and, and last year, December was horrible. December was horrible for this model. Be, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys and truthful. December was very horrible for this model. was not good. The last month of the year, December, you can find trades, but it wasn't as consistent. And I just didn't like it at all. It was a lot of stop losses. It was a lot of no entries. A lot of the entries did not form at all during December last year for UJ. But when we go through this year, we're going to be able to calculate um, which months may be preferred to use the model. So this you can't get here until somebody actually puts the work in. And I'm trying to put the work in so that we have a better idea for the community and how this model can be used. And don't just take my word for it. Take the trade yourself. Open up a demo account and try it out yourself. Everything that I'm talking about, open up a demo account. Or if you don't open up a demo account, back test it. Just look at it. 
and study it but on your own. So if they look back data range. So the whole idea and the thought process of it is the market is coded and it's using certain pivotal moments in its past to project future price action. Because how else is it going to be able to determine what levels is going to run to, what levels is going to purge, where to stop, when to accelerate, when to slow down and consolidate? How else is it going to do it? It has to be reflecting on some type of pinpoint location. Now, this may not be tr the whole answer or the full truth to the market. You'll never hear me say this is fully the truth to the market. There are some things I do say that too. And the only thing that I really say the truth about the market is, is the small range and the large range. It's a very obvious cycle that Larry Williams exposed to me in his book. And I was like, wow, the market does go from small candles to large candles on any time frame. And it's really easy to see it on the daily. When you get a very tiny small daily candle, and then all of a sudden after that small daily candle, you get this humongous large candle. You can even see this is a great example right here. Look how small this candle is. And then right after it, large. But I'm not sitting here saying IPTA is the end all be all to the market. It is just an idea. It is a methodology. It is a strategy that I like to use when it comes to day trading, swing trading, or even scalping. So let's take a look at it. The way I use it kind of confuses people because I feel like some people haven't gone through ICT's full mentorship to understand that it can be used in multiple different ways. He spoke about it many times, but for some reason, it only sticks to some people's heads that it can only be used one time, one way. It's very versatile. Now, the way many people would question it is say, Deontay, I thought I had to move it every single day. That is one way you can use it. That is one way. If you watch other videos and some of the core content, that was like core content month 8th or 7th. It's been a while since I watched through some ICT material since I'm so far beyond that. You'll see when he first introduces it, he talks about how price, you start at the beginning of the month and you look back a certain amount of days and then you cast forward a couple, couple days as well. That's how I use it. And that's the only way I use it. If you want to use it and move it along day by day, it doesn't really make a big difference in my opinion because you're still getting within the same region of data pool if you want to be honest about it. You're still going to be within that same parameter of 20 days looking back, even if you shift it one day forward. It's not a big shift. It would be a big shift if you were shifting it 20 days forward and then moving it. But if you're using it at a day-to-day -day rate and moving the up-to-date look-back data range pool with you as the days go on, it's no different to how I use it, to be honest. It's literally no different. I start at the first official trading day, and I look back, and I count back 20 bars. So I count back 20 bars on the daily time frame, and that's going to be my 20-day look back. I count back another 20 days, and it's going to be 40. I count back another 20 days, it's going to be 60. So we have three quadrants broken down into 20 periods. So increments of 20, 20, 40, 60. Then we like to look for 20 days. Why are we breaking down the market in 20, 20 day or 20 day or 20 bar quadrants? The reason is because when we study the market, generally every 20 days, the market is going to make a new liquidity pool and target a new liquidity pool. Let me say that again. Generally, Every 20 days, the market is going to be looking for a new liquidity pool or creating a new liquidity pool. Or within that 20-day span, it can be accumulating buy side orders or sell side orders. If you take a look at this 20-day quadrant here and this 20-day quadrant here, you can see it was consolidating. So for the month of October in 2023, you can see generally the market was consolidating for those 20 days until at the end of the month we get that large move up. We get that false break, false break here, price runs up higher. Same thing here for November. November, we can see price was consolidating at one point. It runs all the way up, then comes back down inside its range, comes down, runs back inside the range, consolidates. It still closes down. But we can see within those 20-day quadrants, it was consolidating. Consolidating. 
while at the same time also looking for other liquidity pools. But every 20 days, the market's going to throw out a new phase, whether it's consolidation, whether it's uh, expansion, whether it's a reversal, whether it's a retracement. Every 20 days, the market's trying to do something new. It's going to pitch another curve to you, another another um, style of, of throw at you. Is it, is it a curveball? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it a fastball? Is it some other type of, um, you know, style of throwing? It's going to throw a different face every 20 days. So that's just a really small tip I like to use when thinking about the market. Every 20 bars, every 20 days, something can unfold. And sometimes every 20 days, it could continue a continuation pattern. So let's say UJ is bullish right now. That doesn't mean in the next 20 days it has to retrace. That means maybe the next 20 days, it might consolidate for the next 10. But then overall, within that next 20-day quadrant, it's doing another continuation higher. So take that with a grain of salt. But just understand that the market is definitely coded and it's very unique. Let's take a look at some of these levels. Take this off. So let's see when price gets to some of these IPTA levels. So we see price never takes out that 20-day look back low, keeps it open, sell side liquidity. It just runs straight up. And we notice over time, we've been talking about how dollar was trending higher. UJ, UCAD, USWISSY, they were all trending higher. GU, AU, NU, EU, they were all trend trading lower. We know that. And that's correlation there. That goes out to the traders that don't know a correlation. They move opposite. Gold as well. Dollars going up, gold's going down. If gold is going down, that means I know that GU is going down too. I know that NU is going down as well. I know that EU is going down as well. AU, I don't even have to look at the chart to know this because I know the correlation. When price gets to this IPTA, look back 20-day low here. Correction, this is the 40-day. So this quadrant here, from here to here, that's that 40-day low here. We look across price. You know, zoom in. We just type in 40 so we're not forgetting what level it is. So that's that 40-day look back low. Look at how price, and we're not going to get into specific entries or specific lower time frame um, ideas here, but I just want you to look at how IPTA for some reason is giving significant price points to the market why out of all the levels does it stop here at this old low why this old low isn't that suspicious absolutely and you may say oh that's coincidental Deontay that's that's just a coincidence that's just a unicorn that's just luck of chance but we'll see as we go through all the other examples as we go through the examples you'll see it's not a unicorn and it's not something that's just coincidental it's actually very methodical. So price run, you can see price runs through it and then trades right back down onto that 40 day low and gives a nice reaction. It makes the low of the day here and it buys back off of it and then closes and then looks to trade higher the next couple of days. That's very interesting. Let's go on to another level. We got the 20 day level, 20 day high. And then we also have the 60 day low. Put that. Mm, I'm gonna bottom right. Yep, that's that 60 day low, 60 day low all the way over here. Look at it. Look at how price consolidates between those levels. Look at how it's range bound between these levels. Now we have other confluences, of course, right? We could be talking about PD arrays. We could be talking about premium versus discount. We could be talking about algorithmic levels, right? Our 50 levels, our 80 levels, our 20 levels, our 00, zero levels. We can be talking about that as well. But we're just talking about IPTA alone. Because I know people like to jump ahead. And you might get very excited and say, what about this? What about that? Of course, those things are there as well. But I just want to maintain your focus here on the IPTA look back data range level. Just this solely. Look at how price hits this on this day. Let's, do, let's run it back. Price runs up, hits that old, hits that twenty day look back high here, makes the high around it, sells off and closes right on the sixty day low. What? Like, 
what's going on here? It's like magic. Why why close there? Why couldn't it have closed below here? Why couldn't it have closed down here? Why couldn't it have closed up here for the day? But for some reason, this day, when it got to that level, it did that. That's very strange. And this is just observations. I'm not trying to dive deep into it. I'm not trying to sit here and, oh, let's see what happened here on the lower time frame. That's up for you to do your homework there. And when you go on the lower time frames, you'll start to see some very interesting things happening around these levels during the, the kill zones too. Take a look at that. Study that. Trade forward. The candle opens on the 60-day low and, and closes on the 60-day low. Keep going. We're still now. We're now. We're just sitting between these levels. And finally, you can see price trades into that PD array here. I know that, right? Fair value gap that breaks the swing high. That same fair value gap. Look at it. That entry technique. Same fair value gap. Price comes down. Hit that forty day low. Price opens on the twenty day high, right there. It opens on the twenty day high, then it sells off of it. And this this is where we are currently in price. This daily candle opens, runs up, snacks right into the 60-day low again, closes on the 60-day low. Interesting, right? Very interesting. And then we still have these open flow areas here. So we have the buy side here. We got that old 60-day old high here. Even though it's broken, it's still a significant level. I look at this as a significant level because it's the 60-day high, the 60-day look-back high. Not to say we don't get it, get to it in the next couple of days within this 20-day quadrant, but it could still be something that's influential in price action as we go on to the next month. And when I go into the next month, there may be a question that you may have. I reset the whole thing. You can't keep these levels on your chart, but I like to shift it over to the next month. So February is coming around the corner. February 1st will come around. I'll do the same exact thing. Count back 20 bars, 40, 60, count forward 20 bars. Do the same thing. Find those highs and lows. That doesn't mean that these highs and lows are now insignificant to price action because it can still be significant because it is still a data point that it was using during this month. I want to, I want to be very clear on that because that might be a little confusing. Just because I erased it off my chart doesn't mean I'm not aware of it as well. And let's look at another pair. Let's see, what did I mark up next? Did I do DXY? I did do DXY. Perfect. So let's look at DXY. So very, very simple. We can see how price runs up. As soon as it hits that 20-day low, sorry, 40-day low. It's that 40-day quadrant right there. Boom, 40-day low. Look at how price hits right into that 40-day low and closes there. Very interesting, right? I know. Let's see the next day. Look at that. Price does what? Price opens and closes near the low. The next day, same thing as well. It's still sitting inside that range by that level. And eventually, we get away from it. And what could we be aiming for? Most likely, these clean highs right here. Does it mean we have to get there by the end of this 20-day look back, look forward period? No. This is just the 20 day look back period is just our playing field of what we expect to happen. This is our timeline, right? We're trying to predict price action within this 20 day quadrant going forward. In the next 20 days, is price going to remain stagnant or is price going to create some type of purge revert or vice versa, purge revert? Or that's it. Those are the only three conditions I'm really looking for each month. Is this month going to be bullish? Is this month going to be bearish? Or is this month going to consolidate? We'll talk about how we're able to predict or get a better understanding on what pairs we should select going into another month so that we don't run into a month where it consolidates. We don't want to pick pairs that will consolidate for the month. And I think I have a filtering process that kind of weeds out the pairs that will do that or are more likely to do that. And we'll talk about that at the end of the video. Sorry, I just got a text. I'm going to go back to the chat. Make sure everybody is good. Okay, good. Let's look at another pair. Let's see what I have prepared. I don't think I drew everything out yet. I think I only got time to draw that out. We'll, we'll get to oil. So let's draw. Let's, let's do GU for right now. 
right? Since I didn't do it. I've been busy. Normally I would be prepared, but nowadays I've been starting later. I haven't had the time to really start and plan my lessons. Really busy day. Literally don't stop. Work from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep. So 20... It goes that shortcut. Just so you guys can see that I'm not doing it incorrect. Let's see 60. And then we go forward 20 bars. Here we go. Twenty. Twenty. 40 and 60. So this is what it would look like if I was starting a new month. What's the shortcut that for oh, how am I using it? I'm hitting shift. That is a good question. I'm hitting shift and like dragging my cruiser. That's what's happening. I hold shift down and then I click. I'm holding it, holding shift down, clicking, and then dragging. And then I let I, I can let it go. I can let shift go and just move it around. But when I click. It holds it like that, and then when I click again, it disappears. So I'm holding shift and then doing that. Hopefully that answers your question. So you can see how this is how I would start any month. This is this is the this is my building blocks of my model. This is the concrete cement that starts my foundation as forensic forex right here. I'd use IPTA, and of course other things like seasonality, you know, small range, large range on the monthly. And you'll see how all that blends together with pair selection. So coming here, we would mark off the 20-day high. It would be here from the start, January 2nd, start of the year. Can't be January 1st because it's a new year. It's a holiday. The market's closed. High there. Mark off all the highs. November 29th was the high there. And here, see the 60-day high here? It would be here. Even though it's a part of the 40-day, it's still a part of the 60-day too. Is that overlap. So we're taking that high there. It's that 60-day high right there. Now we're going to go from 20-day. I want you to know, this is just the way I do things. It doesn't have to be the way you want to do it. Do it the way you want. If you if you hear, heard someone else doing it another way, do it. And see how that works for you. But this is what I've been using for the last two, three years. Now I have all my IFTA levels, all my significant levels. And that's how I would look to trade for certain things. So you'll see, if you look at the IFTA look back data range library, you'll see examples of, let's say I was bearish on GU. How would I speculate GU being bearish? I'm looking at this liquidity pool to be rated. That's what I would look for, right? Take out the 20-day high based on how it's structured here because we have a 20-day low and we have a 20-day high. I would Let's say I would say I'm going into this month bearish. I think GU is going to go down. I think dollar is going to go up. I think gold is going to go down. And I did the IPTA look back data range and I see things like this. I'm starting to formulate it, right? That intellectual price reading, that intellectual price reading, you know, that IQ score of how you know how, to, how the markets work. This is how I get there. I'm like, okay, maybe this level is the level it takes off and then goes short. Or maybe even if it, maybe it comes up, it fails to break that high, it respects this 40-day look back high, and it continues going lower. And then we get those lower swing highs, lower swing lows, break a swing low, lower swing high forms, go short. See how easy I start to frame these things and pro projecting and forecasting how I think price is going to unfold? Now, those are, those are larger nuances that will only take experience in time. You ain't going to get this in one night. I promise you, you're not. It took me months. to. I had to do this month after month after month to realize, oh, it's so simple. Everybody's just overlooking it. I don't have all the answer to it, but I could get close enough to the answer to the point where I can find success and potentially find profitability. I'm not guaranteeing any one of you guys... 100% success or 100% profitability because you have your specific niche in the style of way you trade. Your personality may impact the way you trade. 
your lifestyle may impact the way you trade. So sometimes the cards you're dealt, you may you don't think like Deontay. You may try to you know get close to thinking like me, which doesn't mean you have to, but you would never be another trader. It's just impossible. You can only be you. And through 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 me is other traders, of course. You know, through me is other traders that taught me in the community. You know, a little bit of ICT, a little bit of Larry Williams, and other than that, everything else is self taught. And other other trading trading guys in the community that I did research and look into, and and picked up one or two tips from them. But all in all, there's not many, to be honest. There's not many people that I really look at and follow. But I would formulate that and go short or vice versa. I would formulate price coming up, maybe respecting the 40 day high and then going, going up higher or another scenario price comes down. Then it goes back up. You see how you start to, you start to speculate and formulate some trade ideas, but I can't force this though. I can't force this. I never force it. It's a day to day activity. I got to wait. And then when it gets to that level, then I start to think, Hmm, what could happen here? What are the other peers doing too? What are their to look back data ranges looking like? What's their seasonality looking like? So you gotta you gotta really paint the picture. All right, there we go. Look. So already let's zoom in. Just look at how price is trading around these levels. Look at that. Look at how it's being held right here by this 40 day high. It's like it's a magnet almost. Like I said, I don't have the answers to everything, but I'm just trying to open your eyes to things that I've been seeing. Now it finally gets away. Now it gets back. Then it hits it. Let me see. Does it hit it perfect? Yeah, it hits it right there. Boom, hits it again. Why out of all levels does it hit that level and then sell off? That's very interesting. Again. And now this is where we are currently in price. This is just observations. So it's pretty broad, right? Pretty broad. I'm not sitting here trying to overanalyze anything. I'm just trying to open up your eyes to this idea. It's interesting. All right, let's move on to another pair. Let's look at gold. I think I marked off gold. I think that's the one of them. I did. Look at, let's look at gold. Ah, you're cheating. You're cheating. You're looking. You're looking. Don't cheat. Don't cheat. Nobody cheat. Price opens. Look at how price opens and it hits. Excuse me. It hits that 40 day look back high. Right here. That old high here hits it. Can't see it here. We'll look at it right there. Boop. Hits it. That day opens, hits it, sells off. Interesting. Next day, see what happens. Trades away from it. Trades away from it. Hits this 60 day look back high here. Closes near it or gets to it. Very interesting. The next day it trades up and it's still within that range. Opens on that, opens just below it and then runs right back above the 60 day high. Keep playing. Let's see what happens. Hits it again perfectly. Get out price comes and hits that low. Why out of all the, I'm sorry, that old high. Why out of all the highs does it decide to make the low right there? Interesting. And that's where, if you're going to be using these levels, there's some advice. If you're going to be using these levels as significant levels to catch a scalping idea or a day trade idea, you need to set alerts. So you have to put the work in. You have to come here, click the, click it, come down here, set the alert, You know, type it in. What's the alert name? 60-day high hit or whatever, whatever you would type it out for so that when – it sends you an email or it sends you a message that you can quickly, you know, jump on the chart and okay, let me just quickly analyze this on the one minute. Okay, do I think a buy setup is happening here or a sell setup is happening here? And then you go from there. Many ways you could look at this. I don't want to force anybody to one style of trading, but you gotta be able to be flexible. It's 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 multi, it's multi what's the word I'm looking for? If we know the word I'm looking for. It's not one dimensional. It's multi-dimensional. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. You, you you can't just be one way. You there's multiple ways. 
you'll come to a liking as you start to progress in your trading career. I've been trading for almost six plus years now. It only took me about three and a half, maybe even four years to actually concretely put together the ideas that I have today because I had to study this day in, day out. And then only like two years ago when I was like, okay, now I can put this into work. Now I can actually see if I could become profitable with these ideas or I could find, or I could get close to breaking that, that ceiling of becoming profitable. And I could break the ceiling of actually passing a prop firm challenge. And I could start to fund my live accounts. That's when you start to, you know, it takes time. It, it ain't, ain't going to happen overnight, man. It's not. So that's gold. Let's look at, this is like crypto. It's <laughs> an interesting one. You, you, you never thought Deontay would be talking about crypto here. But let's bring it back here. You know, there's like one. There's a fellow trader in the in the in the in the chat that likes to talk about crypto a lot. It never shows. This trader never shows that it's Bitcoin, but I know it's Bitcoin because I read the the chart, <laughs> and it's 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 funny to me. So we got twenty there. 40 here. And, we'll, and after this, we'll look at the S&P. 60. Since we're looking at other asset classes, we we'll at stocks. Boom. Here we go. 20, 40, 60. I'm not going to write out all the levels. And then we're going to mark off every highest high. So this is the highest high for that 20-day look back. The highest high within the last 20 days is this one here. This one here. 40. And 60. Stack like inequities. Let me double check. That one's higher. This one's much higher. Okay. So got all the all the highs. And lows for the lows. Low here. And thank you again, guys, for coming out and spending your valuable time to get this knowledge from me. I really do appreciate it. Your time is very valuable to me. Does your Bitcoin include Saturdays or Sunday? I'm not quite sure. It's a good question. I think it probably does. Let me just jump down just to double check. Do do do. It definitely does. <laughs> this one definitely does. I'm not sure how because I don't trade crypto, so I'm not sure how to get rid of that. But for the video's sake, let's just say we're still going along with the with the analogy. Um, cause I, I'm not going to sit here and fiddle around with it. Got the 20 day high, 40 day high, 60 day high, 20 day low, 40 day low, 60 day low. Done. Let's see how the market trades around these pivotal points here. Sunday the opening price for Bitcoin is one. It's midnight, I would assume, because that's what it's showing here. Saturday, going into midnight, it's midnight. Asian time, as in it starts at 6 a.m. Asian time. I'm not quite sure. I'm not a cryptocurrency guy. I can't answer these questions, to be honest. I knew people were going to get so excited. Crypto, I, I don't trade crypto. I just invest in it, buy and hold. You know, whether the investment, whether Bitcoin goes to zero or not, hey, you got to find ways to make money in this world, man. This world is crazy. So you got to find any way possible to make money. So if you invest in the crypto, hey, buy, hold, see if it makes you money. If it doesn't, hey, move on. You lost money. That's what it takes. It's risk. Um, let's see how the price, price trades down. Price trades back into that high. Look at that. Boom. Trades right back into that high. Interesting. Keep playing it forward. Price hits back up to this high. Price hits this low. Returns all the way back. This old high. Returns all the way back up here. Interesting. Even you got that small fair value got to. I know that's there. But I'm keeping your primary focus on just the IPTA levels. I'm not trying to blend in the PD arrays here, guys. We could do that, but we're not doing it here. Just trying to show an observation. 
Price opens, dang, price opens up here, makes the low here, hits that 20-day look back high again, makes the low there, re reaction off of it, sells right through finally. So we got that false break. Everybody was going long in crypto. Huge false break on them. We knew that was coming because dollar was bullish. Um, let's keep playing it forward. And there we go. Look how sensitive that is. Why this level? Yes, it is a swing low, which can be argued here. But why specifically that low does it have to make that reaction at? Boom, and then it runs back up. Very interesting. Trade it forward. Now we trade through it. We got a couple more days because I know it's Bitcoin. And I know you guys were saying something about Saturdays and Sundays. But we can see, look at how price. Let's drag it out forward. Price the next day here on this day. Trades up, runs back into that old high again. Old low, sorry. Old low. And then sells off of it again. Interesting. Very interesting things here. So I'm, I'm not saying I have all the answers. People want to come to me and say, you know the answers? And I'm like, and I feel sorry sometimes not knowing all the answers because I really want to help everybody to their answer. But sometimes I don't even have the answer. And it's okay. And it's something my dad always taught me. He always told me, he's like, he told me, Deontay, you don't need to know all the answers in the universe. Because honestly, if you did know all the answers to the universe, it probably would drive you insane and drive you crazy. If you actually knew the truth about the world and everything that actually goes on on this planet and every X, Y, and Z, all the situations, you know, if you actually knew all the answers about the universe, how it started, how this happened, and how we got to present day, you probably wouldn't be a happy human being, <laughs> to be honest, you know? It would probably be some stuff that you would not want to hear about that is not too pretty. So knowing everything isn't always the best. You don't need to know every single thing in the market to be successful. And I'm just here trying to prove that to you guys. You don't need to know everything and you don't need to get it right every single day. You just need to be consistent to a model. Now let's look at stocks. So let's look at S&P with IPTA. Oh my gosh. I love looking at stocks because I invest too. You know, I invest in buying shares and stuff of, you know, big tech companies, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, the whole mafia of the of the stock market. Honestly, those guys are just monsters, you know, of the S&P. Only a few out of the 500 companies are really holding up the stock market today. Um, let's look at IFTA before I get sidetracked. 2020. I can't believe 2024 is here, man. Like, whoo. So we got 2024. Yeah, it might be a sell coming. Yeah. I don't really like speaking on Bitcoin because I don't I'm not too versed on it. But like with the whole Bitcoin ETF stuff, I think I feel like a pump and dump is coming. I just think a pump and dump is coming. That's all I could say on it, pretty much. Um here. Whether it gains value or not, I just hope it, it gains me some type of investment back return. And it has. So far, because I I'm not selling yet, because I'm trying to make money, man. Uh, twenty. Twenty. Go forty here. Okay. So we have the, the quadrants here. Man, stock market just went hyperbolic, man. Sheesh, you missed out on buying on those cheaper prices. They always tell people, invest, invest, invest. People don't listen. They only learn it the hard way with time. They look back and regret. I could have done this when I was younger. Everybody could have said that, you know? That's why the time is. The time was yesterday. <laughs> the time to invest was yesterday. Had somebody asked me, when's the best time to invest? I told them yesterday. <laughs> yesterday was the best time. Uh, highs, highs. Did I get everything? I'm missing the low. Here we go. For the lines, how do you add it? Oh, the quick shortcut. Someone had taught me this too. It's Alt V. Alt A L T V. Alt V. See, I'm just throwing them in like that. It's Alt V. That's the shortcut. Shout out to that person that gave me that shortcut, man. Shortcuts saving me minutes of my life, man. 
So 20 day high, 20 day low, 40 day high, 40 day low, 60 day high, 60 day low. Oops, this is not the 40 day low. Get rid of that. 40 day low. And let's play it forward. See what the stock market was doing. Let's see. Hits it. Okay, interesting. So it hits it, closes around it. Another time it does it. Gaps down. Comes back up. Completely gaps right through it. But opens and runs into it and then runs away. Very interesting. Keep playing it. I think at this point, yeah, stock market is up. So we're completely out of sight of these levels right now. Does not mean they're not significant and does not mean price will never get back down to these levels again because it might. And in my personal um, tracking right now and my personal speculation on the market, I want the stock market to crash, to be honest. It's not going to be good for the economy. It's not going to be good for citizens and you know, the government and stuff like that. But um, because DXY is rallying, I, I just don't think DXY and DXY and S&P should not be moving in the same direction. They should be moving in opposite directions. So there's a crack in code. So there's something underlying happening in the market. So we're going to probably see it unfold within the next two, three months. One of them is going to finally fix itself and go into its proper correlation. So when you see S&P going up, you're going to see gold go up too and dollar go down and vice versa. So just simple things of how you know these correlations amongst the markets. It's the same thing with other commodities. It's the same thing with other metals. It's the same thing with cryptocurrencies. It's the same thing with futures. It's the same thing with FX. All these markets are interlinked. All of them. Every single one of them. It's a pull and pull. Pull and pull. A pull and, 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 and tug. It's going back and forth. Pull and push. Can't get these words out. Pull and push. One goes up. The other one goes down. One goes down. The other one goes up. That's how it works amongst across the asset classes. And you can also use this in your in your analysis as well. You don't want to be one-dimensional. Look at other asset classes. Think about it. I trade FX. And why why in the world would I be looking at the stock market? Because I know there's an inverse correlation to it. When stocks go up, UJ, UCAD, U Swiss dollar go down. US stocks at least. I'm better at reading like, you know, Japanese stocks, Chinese stocks, and you know, Russia stocks. I have to get good at that. Indian stocks, I have to get look in Australian stocks. But since I live in America and there's so much I can do and study, I've been studying the United States stock market and I see how the, it's correlated to FX. So just because I trade FX does not mean I don't have my eyes looking at other things, right? Looking at Microsoft, Google, Alphabet, Apple. Amazon, Tesla, Meta, NVIDIA. Oh, my gosh, NVIDIA. Whew, just a little quick look. 600 a share, man. Couple, A couple, literally two years ago, it was only $116 a share. And now it's at $600 a share. That is insane rate of return if you would have brought down here. If you would have brought shares down here and you were, you know, saving money and buying stocks, man. That would have been a great rate of return within the next two years. Wow, man. And a lot of people were saying that NVIDIA, the blue chip sector, you know, the chips that go in all these computers and phones and stuff, it's the next biggest thing. Technology only keeps getting better while humanity keeps getting worse. Technology just keeps getting better and better and better and better. And all these tech stocks, what do they keep doing? The tech sector keeps going up, 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 up. Technology only gets better over time. Of course, there's going to be probably a bubble sooner or later. And it's going to be hype. I think personally, there's a big AI hype and all the companies are racing to see who's the best AI company, blah, 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 blah. But that's that's the talk for another conversation outside of Forex. If you guys want to talk about that, we could talk about that in the channel or you could DM me and we talk about that. But um, the same thing applies to all markets. It doesn't matter. And I'm just going to drink some water. If you have any questions, please let me know. We're going to jump on to our next topic shortly and our next topic is the filtering pair pair selection this is going to be a good one all right 
check the chat before I jump on to the next session. Give people time. It's currently 11.22 p.m. It's almost midnight here. All right. It looks like we're good. No questions. All right. So the next topic that we're going to talk about is my my personal filtering process. And most of it comes to attest to Larry Williams. I think Larry Williams was really um, – a critical thinker, right? An intellectual thinker when it came to the market. It's not saying, I don't know how we learned it or how we came about it, but I'm only quoting him because that's who I learned it from. He could have learned it from someone else too. But that whole idea of small range versus um, large range is a concept that I love. Now, why do I love this concept? Let's talk about it real quick. Go to tradingview.com. Right, you want to go to? I'm gonna to go to my channel. Mm -mm -mm. See what I post. Daily updates, man. Called it. It's good to get this right. Called oil to higher prices. People kept saying bearish. I'm bearish. Kept commenting and saying I'm bearish. I'm bearish. I'm like, all right, we'll see. Only the markets will tell. Time will tell. And I don't hear him talking anymore. It's okay, though, because I get it wrong, too. It just feels good to get it right, you know? Pat, pat yourself on the back. Move on. Now, I'm looking for something very specific because it's just a good way to show it. And most of you guys have seen this again because I just keep referring back to this example because it's just a good, simple way to look at it. And how you're going to take this same idea and bring it down. You notice a lot of the, a lot of the things I publish to are private. Some people can't even see these things. But this is my trading journal. This is where it all starts. Where are you at? And they banned. They banned my posts for violating the house rules. I probably like mentioned my YouTube channel, Trading View. Like if you post on Trading View and you mention other platforms, it's against the house rules, which doesn't make any sense because they allow you to put your YouTube link in your bio on Trading View. Essentially you're still promoting your other channel, but they don't want you to talk about your channel in the video on Trading View. So they you can't even see this one. Which sucks, but hey, what you gonna do? Where is this example at, man? There it is. Sheesh. All right. So when it comes to pair selection, this is one of the largest, this is the most significant thing. I put this at the top of the pyramid when it comes to pair selection. Large range versus small range. Now, the market generally after small candles will go into a large range. And the market after large candles will go into a small range. This could be seen on any time frame. I'm showing it here on the daily time frame because Larry Williams taught it on the daily. And I think it's easier to see these ideas on a higher time frame. So you can see here, November 3rd is a small candle. We're not referring to the wicks. We're mainly just looking at the bodies of the candle. Look how small the body is. Look at how the next day trades. Very large body. After this large body, it goes right back into small again. Small back into large. Large back into small. Small back into large. And then so on and so forth. Now, obviously, it's not going to be this clean every single time you trade, but this was just a good example to point out where it was very clean. So that's why I always go back to this example. It's a very good, sound example to take a look at. Now, this same idea can be added to the monthly chart. So think about it. If this is happening on the daily, this can be happening on the monthly. Let's take a look. Let's get off of this. Let's open up. Oh, I already have that open. I could clear all this stuff now. Clear this. What else do we have? I could clear this. I could clear that. This. And you just last one. There we go. Let's go to monthly with UJ. Let's just look. Let's just look at the hindsight that we have available to us right now. Now, 
Let's take a look at what happens after UJ gives us a small, large body candle. Small, large one. It's so silly. A small body candle. Let's take a look. Let's look at this one right here. It's a good example, I see. We can even see that before this small candle, the last month, April, was very large. And then going into May, it's small. So we have that natural range change going on here that Larry Williams was talking about on the daily. It's happening here on the monthly. So April is large, and then May is small. So if I had saw this for April, a large cycle on the monthly, would I be more likely, and I want somebody to answer this in the chat, should I be looking to trade UJ for another large cycle the next month? If I saw April already in a large cycle, should I be trading UJ expecting another large candle? Yes or no? No, exactly. We should not be expecting it. That's not to say we can't get back-to-back -back large cycles. But if we're just trying to be on our toes and be on our P's and Q's and anticipating a small month, we would not expect a large candle to come. We would expect a small cycle range to, to, to unfold, which would mean what? We should most likely avoid trading UJ for the month of May. Now we have a little more foresight and predicting and trying to filter out which pairs are going to go into a small cycle. What are we looking for? We're looking for the months where the market is going to go into a large cycle. So I would opt out of trading UJ for May, regardless of what the seasonal chart is saying, regardless of what PD arrays are saying. I'm just going to simply not pick this as one of the pairs I want to go into May looking at. It's not going to be on my watch list because this month was already large. I'm not expecting another large month. So I need to change the pair. I'm trying to put probabilities in my odds on my side for my odds. But then here, let's say we don't trade May and then May comes, May, May comes to an end. After May ends, I can anticipate what? to happen after May. What kind of size candle should I, should I expect after May, after getting this small candle? Large or small? Anybody can answer it. Large. Correct, guys. See? Now we're intellectually now we're intellectually trying to forecast what price is going to do from a very natural perspective. I don't need an indicator to tell me this. This is why I say the indicators are very detrimental to a trader's development. Traders that started off trading with indicators, they have a hard time breaking those bad habits or falling into patterns that are just not as consistent as you would want them to be. We should expect another we should expect a large candle to unfold after this small month. So what does that mean? Should I pick UJ to be a part of my watch list next month for for um, June, excuse me, yes, we should, because we're expecting a large dynamic range expansion to occur. This was not a large dynamic range expansion. That was small and pretty much back and forth. We don't have to go on the lower time frame to see what happens, but we can only take a second guess. We can take an educated guess, sorry, that price action didn't do much here for this month. It just was back and forth. And then eventually it did take one stance and it closed down. But we can see at one point it runs up, then it runs down, and then it runs back up. So this month almost looks to be consolidating, which it is. That's what those small range cycles are doing. They're consolidating. And what are they doing? They're building in market sentiment. It's building in buy side order sentiment and sell side order sentiment. The retail traders are speculating. The large, the, the, the large traders, the large funds, they're speculating. The commercial traders, they're speculating. The market makers, they're speculating. Eventually, one of these, one out of all the groups and out of all the individuals, right, someone's going to be right on their speculation. And then someone's going to be wrong. For every winner, there's a loser. It's the same thing. Every buyer, there's a seller. Every seller, there's a buyer. So when one guy is winning, another guy's losing. That's just how it goes.
because let's say you 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 took a buy and you got into profit that means somebody somebody sold it to you and took a loss right in theory if you if you brought the market at a certain level and your trade won that means the seller who sold it to you lost that's just how it goes for every buyer there's a seller and every seller, there's a there's a buyer. Every winner, there's a loser. Every loser, there's a winner. The next month, we should expect price to move up with a large range cycle. What happens the next month? Oops, a month of the candles. Interesting. Uh, up, up, up. Going too far. There we go. What happens? A, a large range cycle unfolds. We can also see here. Very interesting, too. You can see that for these months, the open is the low. There's no fake move below the open. So that's something that you will notice sometimes. See how this month here has a wick below it? Because at one point it opened, it dropped below into a discount, and it finds its ideal buy. And then the market makers buy cheap, and it pushes price up. You can see here for this month of April, there's no wick. Actually, oh, no, not yet. No, actually, no, there is none. There is one for June, though. Very small. Very small pullback below the open, and then it runs up. You can see here, April, sometimes you'll get the open to be the actual low. And this is why I was trying to tell traders, you will be forced to buy in a premium. Because you, if you already know that the market is going to trade higher and it doesn't give you, and it doesn't give you that cheap buy, you are now going to be forced to buy at a higher price. What else can you do? You're not going to send it. Even though you're in a premium, you can't sell against it because you know that the market on the higher time frame is trending up. Why am I going to sell against it? So some of those things you got to take by face value and you got to be really intellectual about how you're using these ideologies. Just because price is in a premium does not mean you need to be selling. Price is in a premium all here, all here. And all here. Does that mean you need to be selling? No. What's the higher time frame liquidity pool that market is trying to reach? What is that end goal? You're forced to buy in a premium after the discount prices have already been offered. You think I'm going to stop trading and just you know sell because it's in a premium? No. It already got back to fair value as well because it dropped below fair value. The opening price is fair value. And then it got back to fair value. And then it did its range expansion up. Then it made the high of the month. Then it sold off from the high of the month. But that selling opportunity also happens where? In a premium. Not to say we will be able to call the high of the month or the low of the month. But you can see it's selling, obviously, above the opening price. So there was probably one or two good scenarios to catch a sell in a premium. But the overall bulk move of the month is up. Another large large day up. What should I be doing the next day? I should be looking for what? Another small range cycle to unfold because we went small, large, small, oh, sorry, large, small, large. Would I look to try and trade UJ for July? Most likely not. And that doesn't mean I'm out of luck. I have so many other pairs to trade. I just need to find a, I mainly am looking for a, a pair where the month ends small. That's the most significant thing that I use when it comes to filtering, finding pairs that are primed to move. After this large candle, the market was less likely. I'm just drawing nonsense on the chart. After this large candle here, the market was less likely to be primed to move the next month because I knew that if these cycles occur on all time frames, even the monthly, that means the monthly goes into small cycles too. And I could predict which month it's gonna be most likely small. That doesn't mean I'm gonna be right because it could have been another, it could have been another large month up. But just from having an educated guess, I could probably save myself picking a pair that's gonna be consolidating or not gonna be as exciting. This is not exciting, right? But this is exciting. But what does everybody do during this month when they're late to the party? They're late to this month. UJ's been on fire for April. 
what happens? All the headlines for um, you know, the Forex news news stations or the big um channels that people follow or the platforms that people follow, they're all talking about UJ for April. Oh my gosh, UJ's on fire. UJ's gonna keep going higher. Yo, everybody's bullish. You know, just keep buying. You know, everybody's like lured into these articles where these people are analysts or quote unquote professionals and they're telling you to buy, buy, buy. When they don't even understand the market themselves either because they, they trade off of based on retail patterns as well. So when I see that stuff, I already know the public is being confused and the public is being, you know, it's a whole misdirect. They're getting everybody to buy because nobody knows exactly what's going on. So they're buying at the highs, at the highs. And then next month comes around and then all of a sudden the market just goes, you know, where, what happens to all that energy? What happens to all that hype everybody was talking about weeks ago on all their platforms? It just dissipates. And that's why you can't chase price because it's just not, it's not a healthy way of reading price action. It's not. So keep that in mind. When you're trying to filter out what pair to trade the next month, check to see if that month that's ending or the previous month, check to see if it's in a small range cycle. Because since it's small, everybody's uninterested now. Because everybody's hype. Everybody got hyped in on this month. But this month now, everybody said, man, forget UJ. I ain't trading UJ next month. I ain't trading UJ ever again. And what happens again? It gets exciting again. And the whole cycle repeats over and over again. And then retail traders wonder why they can never catch the large moves or why they can never catch the pair that is ready to fly in one direction. Why they? Why, why is Deontay able to catch the month that's super fast and super dynamic and full of put, and full of opportunities and full of pips? But when I pick a pair, the pair is all non non um. It's not dynamic. It's stagnant. It's not moving because it's the cycle. You just got to be patient. I don't. Larry Williams doesn't have all the answers with the small range, small small range to large range. But it gets you closer to the truth. It gets you closer to the truth. And you can see the natural patterns. Let's look at something else. Let's just look at DXY. Let's take a look at what happens after small days. I mean, small months. Look at these, this leg up here. Look at it. July is small. So should you be looking to trade next month? Yes. You get you get some nice you get some nice range expansion. Still closes off small though, and relative to the last three months. So, the current month that we're looking at, I like to look back the last three to put sometimes three to six months to see what our largest candle is. I like to gauge that. This is the largest candle body and body that we have from July. So, we're still expecting some large moves to unfold sooner or later, at least bigger, at least comparable to this, right? Equal to this in size. Or even greater. So small range. You should trade the next month. Yes. Let's, let's do it together. How would you read it? All right. DXY. Uh, it's boring. But everybody's not trading it. But next month, you should be trading it. Okay. There we go. So nice range expansion. It's primed. It's ready to move. It's ready to move. Should you trade the next, the next month? Yes. Because it's still small relative to this one here. Right, should we still be trading next month? Yes, so let's keep holding that. That idea large again. Now, look, now it's large. Think about this now, it's large, it's larger than these two candles. Should you be trading DXY the next month? Most likely not. You should opt to look at something else instead. You should not be trading this. Yes, it's, it's eye opening. I'm glad that you said that. Thank you for telling me that. That makes me know that my time is not being wasted here. I'm glad you that this is eye opening because people are not looking at it this way and people are not talking about it like this in the community. I don't know why they're not because this is very valuable. It can help a lot of traders. Should you be trading the next month of October? No, you should not. Why? Because it's large. Look at something else. Find something else this month for September that's small. So let's trade. Let's see what happens. Small. Look at that. Look at that. It's small. Wow. 
So we would have saved ourselves the headache there. Would have saved ourselves the headache. Not saying we would get it right, but thank God, right? Or thank the market gods that we were able to predict that. Thank the market makers we were able to see and read this. As I said, the market is it, the market is talking to you. It's talking to you, but you need to be able to translate it. People are not able to comprehend just the candles itself. It's telling you a man a message, and this message that it's telling you here is I'm large, so you better not expect any excitement next month. And we're gonna go with that. That's how I read that. You got a small candle in October. Should we be trading November? Yes. Let's trade November. Let's see what happens. Huge candle. Huge candle. How did we know that? It's almost we have 2020 vision and we're a fortune teller, but we're not. It's just that the data has been providing this day in, day out, week after week, month after month. Large candle. It's primed. It's ready to move and explode because it's been held back for such a long time. For 30 days, right? So for four weeks, for four weeks or, or whatever, a couple of days, it's been consolidating. And everybody said, forget the DXY. I'm not trading it in November. You know what I do? I jump on that. I jump on that because what's happening? Large candles, lower retail traders. I'm not a sheep. I'm a wolf. I'm going to go hunt for the sheep. I'm an informed trader. The small candles allow me to start hunting. Come on. The candles have always been, oh, it's always been telling us this. But it happened to take a while for me to come across this information, of course. It's difficult, you know? And like I said, it's the cards you dealt and the way you get across some information. If I never had brought the, the Larry Williams book, everybody's recommending it. I was like, let me buy it. You know, let me buy the book. It's like $50 or $40 on Amazon here in the States. Let me buy it. Let me see. Since this guy was, you know, the best trader. The, the guy that has the best world record in the Robins Cup, you know? And no one to this day can't beat his record to this day. Let me look into why this guy was able to do that. And his book shows you some of the ideas that he probably used to hold that record in the Robins Cup. Amazing. Amazing. Go back here. I don't trade. Now I trade. Now I want to trade that. And you start to see how you're able to start selecting pairs better. Let's jump on something like gold. Same thing. It doesn't matter what we're looking at. Because I think people ask that question like, oh, what about gold? Of course gold does the same thing. Of course Bitcoin does the same thing. Of course U.S. oil does the same thing. Of course it does. Let's take a look. Let's look at it from the weekly. Like, Let's say we're even using the weekly time frame. Let's say we're looking at the weekly. And I, I, I'm obviously cherry picking now because I, I have to look for an example where it does show it. But look at here. Two small weeks, right? Two small weeks. Everybody's like, dang, man, like gold sucks. It's not moving, man. It's not moving. Yo, let's look at let's look at silver and said. Or not even no, that's not a good that's not a good example. Let's look at GU and said. Let's look at crypto and said. Let's look at stocks and said. As soon as they get uninterested with it, then it market hits them with this. Then they come back running. <laughs> they come back running, trying to chase the, the shorts. Yo, it's on fire again. But by the time they realize that it's on fire, the market's going to change on them. <laughs> it's funny. By the time they realize or come to the realization, most times, I'm, I'm talking about the worst case scenario. Because there's some people that do catch on to this and they do, they're able to capitalize on it. But let's talk about the traders that catch it at the worst point possible. They start selling down here at the lows, which sucks. Because who sells low? Nobody. Well, people do. But you shouldn't. People sell low and it just sucks because then what happens is price turns around and changes trend on them. But notice how it sells. Everybody chases that sell. The next week, it doesn't even move, really. It moves, right? Give some profit if, you, if, if you're lucky, right? Whatever setup you took, you get lucky. But it, do, it doesn't move like this candle, though. Right? That, it's, a different, it's a different swag. It's a different feeling. It's not the same. Because you saw everybody, you saw Deontay catch the high of the week, let's say. Not saying I would. But let's say. You saw Deontay catch this. 
and it dropped. You're like, dang, I got to be selling gold because go- Deontay is doing it too. And then you jump in to sell gold and it goes nowhere. And you're like, what? Man, I'm not listening to Deontay. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And then I go tra- – and then as soon as you start changing your mind, that's when I go back in again. Um, I'm going to buy. And you're like, wait, how did you know it's going to do that? It's all cycles, guys. It's not. It's not complex. It's a very natural thing. But the indicators can't tell you that. So that's one part. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm just going to take a sip of water. And then we're going to get into the, another thing I use to filter pairs. Thank you guys for your time. I really do appreciate you guys coming out and listening to me. It's currently now 11.48 p.m. here in New York. So the second thing I use for selecting pairs that are prime is seasonal charts, seasonal tendencies. Now, bear with me. I think I don't have it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. Seasonal tendencies. Now, this is the source I use. It's a free source. You can pay for it and get the subscription. I don't think it's worth it, but if you think that whatever they offer to you as a trader is worth it, you could do it. And, and this is not a paid promotion or anything like that. I just use this one because this is when I was introduced from ICT and I, I've been using it ever since. Now, when it comes to seasonal tendencies, and I wish I had this prepared because now I'm a, I'm going to be like searching a lot and like moving around a lot. And, and I, I don't like that. Um, Let's go dollar, <clears throat> dollar index. Here we go. What I do when the new seasonal charts drop, right? So how do I know the new seasonal charts came out? It's 2024. And if you look right here, it's showing 2023. So if it hasn't say 20, if it doesn't have the previous year on it that you're currently, then you're looking at, old seasonal data because you're you you want to be utilizing the most recent data and it's taking it's including 2023 into the new seasonal data for 2024 because you can see the time frame is a 20 year range ending in December 31st 2023 so it's looking back 20 years and trying to paint this image of what it should seasonally do over the years sometimes it drastically changes um, I think 2022 or 2023, I think it was 2020, it was one of these, 2021, 2022, 2023. I think gold and oil were the only ones that really moved significantly. Like their seasonal charts look completely opposite from the last year's one. It looked completely different. Like it was all bullish. No, at one point it was all bearish. Then the next seasonal charts for the next year came out. And then it was all bullish. Gold and oil, it was, all, it was just completely flip scripts. Overall, year to year, most of the DXYs or the fiat currencies, they're most likely going to look the same Um, until, like, I guess a decade would pass, you know, 10 years from now when I'm a little older, you know, in my 30s and stuff like that. Maybe the seasonal tendencies will start to change because the seasonal tendencies do not remain the same year after year, month after month, especially decade after decade. They, they're going to change because other things will influence what causes a strength to come into the market and the weakness to come into the market. And the fundamentals may change too, right? The global economic financial policies may change in how things are impacted. So that's just something to think about. But the way I like to map out the full year to get a just of what pairs I want to trade for what month, I like to compare, let's say I'm trading GU, or I just wanted to map out all the pairs. I'm going to take the correlations of the seasonals where they are showing the right code. For example, so let's 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 open up another chart. Let's take let's go here. Come here. And we'll go forex. We're going to go Should give me British pound. There we go. Nice. Don't mess this up, Deontay. You split this on the right side. And of course, I messed it up somehow. I don't even know how I did that. Split this on the left side. 
let's get this framed right so we can see it better. There we go. Yeah, that's good enough. I'm going to look for the, mo the months where gold and DXY are moving opposite to each other. So let's take a look at what months they're doing that. We can see January would not be a good one. You see how January, and, and I can't highlight it, but January for both, for DXY and British Pound, right, are both going up. So I would opt, I would opt out of trading GU for January. Let's see how GU traded this month. Now, now you're going to start to see the filtering process. Hopefully this starts to come, come to full circle. Let's look at GU and how it traded this this um this month. I think this is where we had IPTA on it. So we just have a better scope. Let's look at the month of GU. Look at that. Frustration. And already I've seen so many people frustrated with GU. Frustrated. Look at how it's just going back and forth. You don't want to trade a month like that. And how could I have known that this month would most likely do something along the lines like this? All because of the seasonal tendencies. Right here. They're both moving in the same direction. January is both bullish. So I should not be picking GU. No, no. Leave that alone. Let's take a look at... Let's see. Forex, click Forex, and we're gonna do. Uh, yeah, we'll do New Zealand. Hopefully, it comes up right. Is it this one? Yeah, this. Look at this. Completely different. Look at look at the seasonal tendencies. Now we're gonna start. Now you're gonna start to really start to understand, like. You shouldn't just be picking any pair. Everybody's like, oh, I'm just going to trade AU. I'm just going to trade GU. I'm just going to trade this. You're going to get stuck with a pair that is not ready to move for that month. You are, you're you're bound to because it happened to me too. Even through this filtering process, as much as you try to filter out the best pairs, you still might end up with a pair that completely gives you a month that is consolidating or accumulating. But you're trying your best to weed out all the pairs that will do something funny that you don't want. You want it to be the smoothest price action as possible. Look at how GU, uh, GU, British pound is going up, dollars going up. Let's look at New Zealand dollar. Opposite, right? Dollars going up and New Zealand's going down. This is going to make me want to trade NU over GU. Now let's take a look at how NU traded this month. And I was trading NU. Earlier this month, if you guys recall, if you go back in the chat, I was showing some charts of NU and some trade setups of NU earlier in the month. Let's go to NU. I'm going to go on this one. It didn't even matter because I didn't do the IPTO on this one. See, I was, I was, I was trading it too. I, was, I even have it on here. I was trading it, looking for shorts. Look at where we are in the, currently versus GU. Look at how different this month is. This is January on a daily. That's interesting. Wow, the first day is January 1st for this pair. It's my first time seeing that. Wow. Huh. I thought it would have been January 2nd since it's a holiday, but it has a, a candle there. That's so strange. Oh, whatever. Um... Right on to February. Look how different that is from GU. <laughs> right? Completely different. GU. Where are you at, GU? Let's get it side by side now. Look at that. Look how GU. Clear this off. See, that's so strange. Look, how, look at how GU. Starts that the, the yeah, yearly open is on the second, but New Zealand dollar is on the first. I've never seen that. That's my first time observing that. Huh. That's really interesting. I wonder why. I guess the market was open for them on that holiday. That's so strange. 
But look at the difference. Look at how GU for the almost the we're almost done with the month of January. Time is now. Stop wasting time. By the time by the time you blink, it's gonna be twenty twenty five. Look how look how different this is. And then when we look at the seasonal chart, it or it told you that this might have been a better pair to trade for GU. And like I said, I didn't add the monthly large range or small range to this. And you could do that. You could have those confluence as well. But I'm talking about this one separately by itself right now. Look at how it was more it was preferred to trade New Zealand dollar over GU. Hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully that makes the idea of how you're using seasonal tendencies as a roadmap. Now I can just simply go along each month and just and start to frame. Okay, February. February's up for DXY. Okay, that's good. If February's up for DXY, I better see February down for New Zealand dollar. Now, we don't really have that there. It's not really showing a strong sign of trending lower. It does show a strong sign. It does show a small sign at the end. But all in all, it looks like it's consolidating. So I probably would opt out for this one. I want it to be very obvious and clear. Even though it does show that small bearishness going into March, I still want it to be very strong, a very strong indication. So I wouldn't trade that. So let's jump back to, to GU. Look at GU. Strong. It's a way stronger indication than NU. It's saying that it's going to be very bearish. It's going to be. It's going to sell off strongly in February. And dollars are going to rally strong in February. Should should I be trading NU or GU for the month of February? Can anybody answer that in the chat? Based on what I just told you guys and explained, should I be trading? You only seen oh you only seen one seasonal chart. I apologize. Wow, because I think my share. Thanks for speaking up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, 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 wow. More. Um, your sharing screen. Let me fix that for you guys. Thank you for saying something because I would have been sitting there and not showing you both charts because it's good to see it both side by side. New share, entire screen. Now, let me know if you can see both charts now. Anybody can tell me. You, yep. Okay, cool. Great, 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 great. So now we're back on part. Back on part. Affirmative. Great. Let's go. So let's let's run it back real quick. Let's run it back. Let's run it back. So January for DXY is bullish. And on the right, British pound is bullish too. Do you guys see that? They're both bullish. How could that be? That's against market code. One fee, the, the dollar, if king dollar is up. King 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 Pound should be down. It can't be the same. One of them has to be one of them has to be superior over the other. They can't be moving in the same direction. So and also that too. You you yeah, you 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 you're jumping ahead, but you, you're on the right track, my friend. You're on the right track. You're right there. That's the next topic. We're gonna talk about the interest rates. Don't even <laughs> you you're already thinking ahead of the curve, man. Good thinking. But based off of the seasonality. Right, we can see they're both bullish. Ideally, you want them to be moving opposite. We don't want them to be moving in the same direction. So when we come over here, get this full screen. Go back, split it. Oh no, I was looking at the wrong one. There we go. We split it. Uh, jump into DXY on the left. DXY is bullish. Right? Bullish. But look at British pound. It's consolidating. The seasonal tendency has showed you that this pair most likely wouldn't have been best because its seasonal tendencies did not even show the signs of respecting market code. So you knew you were going to get something funny this month. Everybody was having difficulties trading GU this month. You see that? This is difficult to trade. As a day trader, at times this can be difficult. As a scalper, at times it can be difficult. As a swing trader, this can be difficult, very difficult for a swing trader to trade this or a position trader to trade this because you want the market to move. A swing trader wants this. They want, they want direction. A day trader should want direction. 
A scalper, eh, that could be debatable. But you want direction in the market overall, no matter what kind of trader you are. It just benefits you as a trader. When you're in an environment like this, it's just not suited for trades. It's carnage. You don't want that. But now let's take a look at dollar versus New Zealand dollar. Look at that. January is up and New Zealand dollar is down. Yes, it does show a, a sharp incline, but then it has a very steep decline too. It's showing obvious signs that seasonally New Zealand dollar should be getting weaker and dollar should be getting strong in January. Let's take a look at New Zealand dollar. Make this full screen again. Let's take a look at how New Zealand dollar traded compared to GU. Look at that. Like I said, I was trying to I was trading it this month as well because I was following the trend formula. Look at that. Swing low broken. Bearishness. Wait for a lower, wait for a lower daily swing high. What did I get? A lower swingly day high. I was able to get those sells. Beautiful price action, fam. Right? Beautiful. But you don't get that unless you're actually filtering out the pairs. You can't. That's why when I hear traders tell me, oh, I'm just trading this pair. I'm just trading this. I'm like, okay, but why? Why are you trading that pair? Is it just because you like it? Is it because it's the first pair that you kind of had, you know, most consistent wins with? Is it just a pair that for some reason you hear other people talking about, so you just want to follow them too and trade the pair too? Those are not objective reasonings. That's all subjective. If you're if we're going to be objective about the pairs we select, we need to find concise data. We need data to help provide us a context of why we should be picking this pair for this month. Not every pair should be traded for the same month for the entire year. Unless you're using a non-biased model or you're a scalper or something like that, or you're using a very you know, cookie-cutter-like model approach like the Asian session model or the New York model or the London model, and you're not basing it off a of bias, then you you have you have all odds against you. You know you could you could take you could take your risk on that. But if you're somebody that is looking for sustainability and consistency in the market trend, and you want to trade in that direction, and it makes it easier for you to understand when you should be buying and when you should be selling, you need to be picking better pairs to trade, because GU was garbage this month. GU was completely garbage, but everybody wanted to trade GU though, right? But I wouldn't have because of the context behind it. What am I doing before I start? What is your checklist and processes before going into a new month? Everybody gets into a new month and you 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 haven't even done your due diligence on the pair or the or or the or, or the fiat currency by itself, right? You haven't done your due diligence on British pound. You haven't done your due diligence on New Zealand dollar, euro, Australian dollar, Japanese yen, etc. You haven't done your due diligence on these things. You got to do it. So that's another way I like to use seasonal tendencies to help me pick, figure out when to find a better pair to trade for the new month. Hopefully that is, you know, something that is eye opening for you guys. I really want you guys to understand that. The industry is not talking about this stuff. It's funny. I know I'm laughing, but I'm laughing because I'm like, I want other people to wake up. Wake up. Like, yo, it's right there. The information is for you to grab. It's 2024. Do not let 2024 go by and you're not utilizing all this information. Do not go into 2025 and you still haven't set the concrete for these new ideologies and methodologies. Take out all, forget about what you learned about in the past. I'm not saying it can't help you, but odds are, I know that information in the past that you learned was most likely spewed in a way that you were having difficulties or it was complex to a point where you're like, this doesn't make any sense. I shouldn't be using it, but you use it anyways and you still find it hard to trade. I want to make it as easy as possible for every trader to trade. I want to make it as easy as possible for you to comprehend the market without any indicators on your chart. As soon as we start talking about RSIs and moving averages, you guys should cancel me instantly. You guys should all unsubscribe, leave the Telegram channel, tell me I'm the worst trader in the world. As soon as you hear Deontay talk, start talking about indicators, leave me alone. Leave me alone. 
because when I hear other people's when I'm oh man, this is a funny story. One day I was getting into Uber, right? Going into the city in Manhattan. Get into Uber, leaving my house, going to the city of Manhattan, right? To go see my girlfriend, going on a date, right? I get in this I get in this Uber, right? And this guy, you know, we're talking, 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 you know, just keeping it casual, small talk. And he goes and he tells me, he I, I, I'm like, you know, asking like, what does he do? And blah blah blah. The second third, he's like, oh, you know, I do this on the side part time because like, my real job is trading. And I was like, oh, your real job is trading? I was like, word, nice. So I was like, what do you trade? He's like, oh, I trade FX. And I was like, wow. And I was like, little do you know, I trade Forex too, my friend, you know? It's not something I go around telling random traders I trade. Because some people can give a rats, you know? A rats behind about trading and what you have to say about trading. And Forex in itself already has a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths because of IML and all those um, affiliate marketing strategies, scams, you know? So it already has a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. So I don't like to bring that up to people. I just tell people when they ask, I'd be like, hey, I trade. And they ask me what I trade. I'd say I trade, I trade foreign exchange. I don't trade, I don't say forex because some people don't even know the difference. They don't even realize foreign exchange is forex, but whatever. The guy tells me he trades forex. I'm like, oh, cool, right. I'm like, word, like, that's what's up. I was like, I trade it too. And I was like, what do you like? I start now, like he's speaking my interest because it's not every day you come across a trader in public, you know? Like some people don't have a large personal friend group of people that trade. And that's something I'm working on, you know. I have one good pal, and he 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 doesn't trade forex, but he trades stocks, and he likes to look at stocks day to day, and like to like you know speculate. Oh, is Apple going up, or is Microsoft going down, or stuff like that. But get back to the main point. He shows me his chart, right? He takes off the GPS navigation, and he shows me his chart because I'm I, on the middle console, and immediately. I knew the guy couldn't trade. You know how I knew he couldn't trade? And there's nothing against him. He had almost 20 indicators on his chart. I couldn't even see the can I couldn't even see the candles on his chart. So I knew he didn't know what he was talking about. And then he goes on to say, um, because that was at that time, that's when I had just got funded again with FTMO and I got another prop term, prop from a challenge, uh prop from account. And he as well, I guess, was in the midst of getting funded or whatever the case may be he was like i just set the new record for this prop firm and i was like oh congrats whatever the case may be they're trying to interview me and blah blah blah, blah. and i was like good man keep going you know and then he tells me prop for, these, these prop firms are only made for scalpers and i was like bro what are you talking about you know in back of my head i'm just thinking to myself i'm like he's like the prop firms are mainly just for scalpers and i was like that's not true the prop firms are for any style of trading you know it doesn't matter what kind of account you have. Of course, you know, we know the limitations of it, you know, the swing account or trading during news or whatever. But prop firms have made it available for all styles of trading, especially in the day of 2024. So when he was telling me that, especially in 2023, when he was telling me that, I was just like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Then he was like telling me about his strat. And I asked him, you know, I started to like read the guy. It's like, what's your model? And instantly he couldn't even give me a concise like one, two, three. He couldn't. So when I start to see those things, I start to read people. I'm like, you don't know how to trade, bro. And it's okay. I let him talk me and chat my ear off the whole ride, you know, the case might be just to see like how he thinks as a retail trader and how he trades as a retail trader. Cause I'm completely opposite to the way these people trade. I don't trade like these people. It's a small community of people that trade the way that I prefer to trade. There's not a lot of people that trade this way. And there's, there's definitely a lot, of course. But when we compare it to a vast majority, it's a small bubble. And then you got this large grand scheme of people that trade the way they trade, and which is why they have the poor results they have. But that was just a little side story I had one day. It, it was it was a funny trip. And I got out, the, I got out the, the lift, and I told my girlfriend, I was like, yo, he doesn't know how to trade, man. And my girlfriend doesn't trade, but I'm, th I'm, I'm teaching my girlfriend how to trade the agent session model. Definitely get in the hang of it. It's so simple. You could teach this model to anybody. It's just amazing. You know what I mean? So it's so simple. And um, I get out the car and I'm just like, yo, this dude, he was chatting my ear off. He doesn't know how to trade. I was like, babes, he got indicators on his chart. And she's like, yeah, I know. You be telling me people that trade with indicators don't know what they're talking about. I'm like, yeah, man. Like, it was funny. It was funny. It was a funny ride, man. That was a funny ride. But yeah, this is how you got to really weed through the market. You got to think different. You can't be with anybody. 
Can you show an example using seasonal with crude? I can. I definitely can. Um, you can go to crude. Let's go to crude. Uh, uh, see, with the seasonal charts? Yeah, let's go over. I don't need this anymore because this is the last thing I'm going to talk about for seasonal. So let's go back to FX. No, no, not FX. Let's go. See if I can find it. This one that I use specifically. There it is. Boom. Very bullish, man. Whew. Oh, man. This world. 2024. If this comes to fruition. Oh, man. You don't even want to talk about economic crises, man. Don't be happy. Don't be happy about oil prices going higher. That That's not good for everybody. It's not good for us. January, February, it's going up. Um, if we had we if we had to compare this to something, right? So this is something I said at the beginning of the daily bias tracking for the daily tracking for US oil. We were talking about oil and CAD futures. And let's bring it back here. Let's see if I still have it on my chart. I should have it on my charts. Let's bring up CAD. If you go back to episode one or episode, I think it's episode one or Episode one, episode two, or episode three of the daily updates to US oil this month. You see, I was talking about the CAD, the CAD futures, because I was comparing it to oil. Let's see if I still got it up here. I still do. There we go. I had said that I would like to see CAD decline in price. I wanted to see this go lower in price action. And then while this is going lower, I would want to see oil go higher. Now, there's a big, I guess, gray area when it comes to the correlations and the seasonalities around oil. So many people would say, oh, when Canadian dollar goes up, oil goes up. But here we can see it's not true. The seasonal tendencies are a little funny and the correlations are a little funny when it comes to oil because it changes very often. It's not something that it's a, it's a timely manner and how long it stays correlated to certain pairs. You see at sometimes it's correlated with dollar and it runs with dollar in the same direction. But then for months at a time, it breaks off and it moves in the opposite direction to dollar for months at a time. And then it gets back on track with dollar again. So it's very interesting with oil. Um, but I was able to challenge myself this month with it. Canadian dollar was selling. The futures of it was selling. But when we look at oil... It was going up. And then when I look at DXY, I have to I have to say this because it's the context behind it. Put DXY on here. Uh new price scale, I believe. Yep. So it's opposite, you see? It's opposite. So you see dollars going down in December. Look how CAD is going up. So it's opposite. So when I take this correlation and add it to US oil, let's take US oil. Look at how the correlation is a lot more stronger. It's positive. It's moving with it. We line it up. It's moving it. At times, like I said, it gets out of whack. It doesn't always move in the same direction. But generally speaking, when dollar goes up, oil goes up. So that's the correlation I like to stay with. I don't like to stay with when CAD goes up, oil goes up. You will go searching on like a lot of like you go searching on baby pips or a lot of these um, free public education um, platforms that teach about correlations. And the first thing that they will tell you is cat is significantly tied in with U.S. oil. And I'm here to show you that it's not. It's, it's just not. I think those years of it being correlated to um, oil is over. U.S. oil and dollar move together as of what we know right now, current price action. So you can see dollars going up, oil's going up. So I had no troubles. I had no troubles of calling oil higher. Everybody kept screaming bearish oil, bearish oil. But I said dollars going up. So oil must be going up too. So that's me being inquisitive and thinking outside of the box and being multidimensional. Having a multi-market analysis, a multi-intermarket analysis. But to go back to oil, let's get this off the chart. 
I'm looking for the seasonals. There we go. Seasonals. And now let's compare it with um CAD. Split it. Well, let's compare it with DXY actually. So I should have kept the XY on the chart. Is you yep, there you are. That's good enough. You can see both sides. <laughs> so looking at this, we can see look how oil. Look how oil in February and dollar in February are both moving in the same direction. What what could that only mean? Super bullish cycle might be unfolding. They'll both create, yeah, they most likely will create a low and move higher. That's, that's also a good answer too. They'll create a low at some point in time and move away from that low and respect that low. That low will be protected and price would not want to run that low anymore. And price would run higher. But we could see how January for oil, a little back and forth in, in, in January to, for oil and in January for DXY, also back and forth, but still moving in a bullish direction. Oil did not give that strong sense of being bullish in January, but I still happen to take the risk with trading it because I just was I was challenging myself. That's the only reason why I picked oil because I just wanted to prove to the community that it doesn't matter what I'm looking at. I can read it. It's all the same. So February is going to be very strong for oil. And we might see oil continue to trend higher for February. Now, March, you can see March March and DXY do almost the same thing. Look how it dips down, dips, dips down. You like to see those positive correlations. But then look at April. Look how April is bullish, but U.S. Uh, dollar is bearish. I would not trade U.S. oil. I would not trade U.S. oil in April. Even if it still gives me up move, right? Let's say April passes by and it does follow the seasonal tendency. I don't care. I still have that threat of it not aligning with code. So I wouldn't be using that here. So I can't do that here. So hopefully that was insightful. That's the only example I could really give with crude oil right now because of what happened in recent time. I don't have the data to last year's seasonal charts to go back. But it's not that – I don't know. Actually, this is very different from last year's chart, I believe. It's a little different, I think. I print them out. I print them out every single year and put them in a, I put them in a binder so that when I get – when I become an old man, I'm able to show my kids that, yo, like these years were insane or these years were really less volatile so that they have some stance and data. You know, I'm building my own library – for myself so that I can pass down to the next generation. It's, it's big. Like I said, it's always bigger than me. What I'm doing right now is not that important. It's what it's really all the time that I'm putting in for the next decade, the next two decades. So when I'm 50 years old, 60 years old, and I actually start a family and I actually have a son, I actually have a daughter and I could turn around and tell them, this is what I know about trading, right? You can go to school if you want. You want to get a degree, go ahead. But if you're going to live in my household, my rules, you're going to be a trader because I think it's beneficial to you as that to have as a skill. You want to be able to make money without somebody telling you how to go, you know, when to clock in, when to clock out, when to go on vacation. And that's why I like trading. It's my only bet. But hopefully that was insightful. Now, my last. My last way to filter out. Pairs is going to be our interest rate differentials. So let's make this larger. I'm going to open up another tag. I'm just going to drink a little bit of water. Shake some water. And now we're going to start talking about the interest rate differentials. Hope you guys are learning a lot tonight. Like I said, it's not much... Because after a while, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I already do sound like a broken record every day because I just try to really dial this in and get this across to everybody. I sound like a broken record every single day because I'm not somebody out here trying to make more content that's new. You know, I'm not 
farming for views. I'm not farming to, yo, look at this new model I found out. And then I try to run up views and try to get monetized. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to show you exactly what I do. Everybody was out there. And this is just another side note. Anybody can sit here and recreate another person's program, right? Let's think about it. Anybody could have went through ICT or Larry Williams and made a video and made a video just like their videos on every single month, every single month, core, core content, month one, month two, all the way to market maker series, primer. Somebody could make the same content just like them. But what did I do instead? I picked out specific lessons that stuck to me from learning from ICT and I repackaged it in the way that I comprehend it in the way I think it would make more sense. And that was it. I said for 2024, I will not be making any new model videos because it's unnecessary. There's no need for me to talk about some new model or, or some new cycle 90 minute cycle 30 i don't need to start talking about those things because i one i don't use it in my trading model and two i don't think there's something that is reliable that's just my personal preference i'm only going to talk about the bulk significance importance of what makes trading trading everything else could 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 be for somebody that really wants to know everything about the market but all those videos that you see on my channel Eleven videos. Eleven, and I think, let's see, high odd reversals. That's something I learned from ICT. If the data range, something I learned from ICT. High probability, ICT. Outside bar model, Larry Williams. Sunday's opening price, ideology. I learned from ICT. Not saying that you could have learned this outside of ICT too. Daily draw. This is a concept I learned. How I learned it was through ICT. Premium ICT. New York model, ICT. Entry techniques for swing traders, ICT. Monthly monthly characteristics, that's my personal breakdown and how I explain things over the time. Uh, turning points, Larry Williams. Now think about that. Out of everything, and I was in ICT's paid mentorship, out of everything that I learned from ICT, this was the bulk of what I thought trading was. Only these few videos and Larry Williams as well. Let's go back. That's 2023's mentorship program. Or my my mentorship program, you know, quote unquote. Let's go back when I first started making the 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 lessons. Twenty twenty. Ah, uh, no. Thank you, YouTube. Larry Williams, speculators. That was just me. That's my own education me going and learning how the speculators work and my methodology. Midnight opening price, an ideology I learned from ICT. The four phases of the market, that's fundamentals. Anybody can learn that. Asian session model, like I said, I, I, I learned this about a year ago and I was starting to implement it. ICT, high probability scalp, ICT. Seasonal tendencies, stuff I learned from ICT's core um, um, mentorship program. If the data range, High probability scalping again. When to avoid trading London. Weekly range. The full Forex trading day. That was my personal um, knowledge. AMD, ICT. And the session, the kill zones, ICT. Now, out of all that, that's all the only, what, how many videos is that? 14 videos. And some of them are part twos and part threes and even remakes and the other videos. Out of all the millions of videos that ICT has, these are the only videos that I've made because I thought that they were the most significant videos that people should be using from ICT. If I had to go back, if I had to go back four years ago, six years ago, and tell my younger self what to trade, I would say, this is this is the playlist you should be looking at and focus on that. Everything else is extra. It's just a little too much. The, the Asian session range, standard deviations, central bank dealers range, flout, all that stuff is extra. 
that's for the guys and the gals that want to learn every little part of the market. But you don't need to know every little part of the market to be successful. Got to keep it simple. Another part of picking prime pairs for trading the next month is the interest rate differential. So currently, we're going to be in some funny times. And the reason I say that is because the rates amongst the central banks are really close to really neck and neck or really close to each other. The gap that they have between each other, the space, the difference between, let's say, the feds versus like the bank, the um, the BCB, the British Central Bank, right? It's it's pretty much close. It's not a huge difference. So eventually, we're gonna start to see markets not moving properly. So that's one reason. Another trader had pointed out in the in the Telegram, sorry, in the Zoom chat, why GU didn't really move anywhere. Because the rates are the same, literally almost the same. It's just a 0.25 difference. But take a look at something like UJ, right? And what, what pairs can we take out of UJ? What what banks can we take out? American Central Bank, the Feds, and we can take out the BOJ, Bank of Japan. Negative. Look at the rate difference. Huge rate difference right there. That's a point, that's a point a point a five point four difference there. Right there between and if we look at uj look at how it traded this month and you may be asking why is this important why are we looking at the interest rates deontay why is it that important look at uj it's just ready it's excited it's like yo i'm gonna fly i'm gonna move and we can see this we can see the same thing for most other yen crosses as well NJ some somewhat. Let's look at another yen. Cad J, look at that. So what two banks can be look be looking at here? I think that is I'm trying to remember the acronym. Um I think it's BOC, Bank of Canada. That's how you would say it. The BOC. Where are you at? I'm definitely overlooking it. Oh, there it is. The CCB, I believe. I think it's BOC actually. I'm not sure. Um well, look, its rate is 5%. And Japan, like I said, it's still negative. It's a big difference between Canada and Japan. Big difference between those two. Let's look at how CAD-J tr traded for the, for the month of January. Trending. Trending. And I could, I could jump into a whole side note and talk about daily bias here. Because the same thing is happening. Swing high broken, higher swing low, down candles, buy after the down candles, it runs away. Come on. It doesn't matter what pair you're looking at. They're all going to most likely do the same thing. Especially especially if they're all the yen, if, if, they're, if they're part of the yen crosses. Let's take a look at another yen cross. British pound versus yen. Look at the difference between British pound versus yen versus GU. <laughs> Look how GU, nice range expansion, but look at GU. Why is that? Because this is a strong currency versus a weak currency based on their rates. Now, when you take GU, taking a strong currency and matching it with a strong currency, that doesn't make sense. It's not going to move. There's going to be conflict. They're going to butt heads over and over again like a ram. Over and over again, they're going to keep butting heads. Nobody's going to win. They're equally matched, right? But here, we take British pound versus Japanese yen. One of the goats or one of the sheep or whatever, or one of the rams is weaker. Japanese yen is going to buckle. When they when they clash head-to-head, -head, whenever, you, whenever you guys see those, those bucks, they hit each other head-to-head -head and one of them drops, Japanese yen is the weaker one. British pound comes in, headbutt, Japanese yen drops. That's what you're seeing here with the market here. But when it comes to British pound versus U.S. dollar, they're evenly matched every time. It's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere because the yield, and now we're going to talk about why the rates are important. The yield, the interest rates are the primary driver to the fiat currency world. The primary driver. Forget about NFP. Forget about housing market data. Forget about job data. Forget about inflation. Right? Those are important too. Those are some fundamentals that go into this too. But if I had to say one news event or one 
event that triggers and really commands the fiat currencies, it's going to be the interest rate decisions. Those policy decisions that these banks are doing worldwide are a direct correlation to when the investors are going to come in or when the investors are going to lose. Do you think in any world, at any point of time, that somebody is investing into Japanese yen? No, they are not. Japanese yen is terrible. Terrible. Since 2016, they dug themselves into a hole. They've never made the chance to pivot themselves to increasing their interest rates to have a more competitive fiat currency. Who has the most competitive fiat currency? And we're not talking about the ones like this. Hungary, yeah, no. Even though they have 10.75, there's other things that go into it that I currently still have to be educated on with their GDP, with their population, with corruption, et cetera, et cetera. And the way they are set up with world trade, just because a country does have a higher interest rate doesn't necessarily mean that their currency is going to be way better than others because there's a lot of other factors that are layered onto it. But if we're going to talk about developed countries and developed nation, nations like America, the EU zone, uh, the UK, uh, Canada, uh, Australia, if we're going to talk about those countries like that that are way more developed and advanced in technology and world trade and GDP, those currencies tend to outperform. Now, when you compare them to each other and you compare the interest rates, you start to see who starts to take more control over each other and who demands more respect. The feds always demand respect. The feds always, the dollar will always demand respect. That's for outside reasons because of military purposes, winning certain world wars, et cetera, et cetera. But as of right now, when we start to see rates amongst the developed nations get closer to each other, the pairs start to be less volatile to move. We're going to start to see the central banks either step into the market and start moving the interest rate policies, especially to compete with the feds, whether they get a higher rate than the feds or whether the feds lower their rates. And then the other, the other banks follow suit It's tit for tat. So hopefully that was influential and in how you are supposed to look for prime pairs Looking at the rates, if you're going to pick a pair going into the month, you need to be picking one that's strong and one that's weak. You can't pick one that's strong and strong. GU right now is too strong. Too strong. I would not be touching GU for a very long time. The rates need to change. But you can see why I've been trading G UJ. Everything against the Japanese yen is going to fly. But everybody's overlooking that, though. Everybody's looking lo looking over that. You need to understand when the market is going to be preferred to move. Start looking at the yen crosses. I've been saying this for the last two years. Start looking at the yen crosses because there may not be a never uh, there may not be a time like this ever again in history. Because maybe the next twenty years, the Bank of Japan may raise their rates, and you ain't never going to get those markets to move as smooth as they do now. That's why I said the time to invest was yesterday, not today. It was yesterday. You should have known these things yesterday, but we don't know it. But now we do. Moving forward, we should be able to apply these concepts. Don't waste time. We only live on this planet for a short period of time, and we trade our time for this stupid money. So if we're gonna if we're gonna play in this box of trading our time for money, you need to be on your A game. Time is ticking. I'm only twenty. I'm I'm a twenty five year old young man telling you this. I know there's other folks in the channel that's way older than me, that are you know seeing other chapters of life, but I totally understand what's going on, and I know I don't have time to waste. I don't have years to waste. I ain't gonna be young forever. I gotta move on with life, and the time is now. I gotta do it. Gotta do it. Gotta do it. So that's it on our daily bias. Daily bias. I'm like a robot. On our premium versus um, our filtering pair selection. Now we're just going to get into premium versus discount via monthly. So this is the last topic. After this, ask me whatever question you want. And then we're going to end it because it's now 12.36 a.m. here. It's now currently Friday morning. Um, where are we at now? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna get into the monthlies. Monthly, monthly, monthly. All right, cool. We're gonna use oil. I mean, when are you gonna use oil for this example? Because I want to be able to get some sleep in. Uh, U.S. oil, and this will be posted, of course, on YouTube. It will be posted. I don't edit these at all. I don't edit them. I do try to put in the time card so that you guys can find the segments of it too, so it's easier for you guys to move around. I can't clear this because I want this on my chart still. But let's – can I – no, I'm not clearing it. No, 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 no. Let's take a look at U.S. oil. So we've been calling it higher, and we got that. But take a look at how many times price moved below January's opening in price before link and trending higher and completely leaving remotely being close to January's opening price. It did it multiple times. Let's count. One time. Let's count how many times it was below discount, at least. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and let me just check to see if that's one. Eleven. You had eleven days to get a discount buy out of oil before getting that rally up. So the market gave you opportunities. It gave you eleven days. Sometimes it's even less. Sometimes it's zero. You ain't getting no opportunity. Sometimes it's open and it just runs up for the rest of the month. And you ain't going to get it. Here we can see price gives 11 days to get that cheap buy. And I kept mentioning over and over again, even if you do get that rate of a swing low, it could just be them rating sell side liquidity to get sponsorship to run higher. We talked about that in one of the daily update videos. They just ran this low to run higher. If the market is going to trend higher on the monthly, let's check out the monthly. Check out the price action on the monthly. Price comes up and breaks a swing high formation. According to my trend formula, breaking a swing high, I got to do this on another, another thing because I'm going to have to clear it. Breaking a swing high is bullish momentum. Does it mean it's going to trend that direction? Not necessarily, but we need confirmation to understand whether or not it's going to keep going that way. That confirmation comes by way of a higher swing low. Are we getting a higher swing low formation? Yes, we are. January confirms that higher swing low. How does it do it? Well, let's see. The lower swing low is here. And this is your monthly higher swing low. January takes out the middle candles high. Here, so this swing low is confirmed for sure. For sure. At this point, we could speculate price action to probably continue trading higher going into February, March, April, and so on and so forth until it gets back up to what? Another swing high. Unless price fails to break the swing high and then it changes trend. But that's out of the scope of question right now. Until we get there, we'll get there. But since I have the stance of understanding that price action was going to go higher via monthly and via weekly, how did I know? How did I know by the weekly time frame? Because I saw a higher swing low get printed in. This is how I was. This is how I was a little uh, uh, against the edge. I had the edge against the retail traders because I was reading it this way. We had this swing low here, one, two, three, and I said, okay, cool. And then all of a sudden, I saw another swing low form. One, two, three. And I saw it, it was higher. I was like, oh, it's higher. I was like, okay, this might be signs that the market truly doesn't want to go lower and it's trying to print higher swing lows. And I told myself, okay, going into 2024 January, I should expect price action to continue going higher because the weekly looks to be printing a higher swing low. It's failing. Think about it. This is what I said earlier. It's failing to break this low. So you're getting that mitigation to go higher. Instead of getting a breaker, breaks it, comes back up, trades into it, and then goes higher. It doesn't give you that. It's making that mitigation. So with that in mind, I know that the market is going to continue to trend higher. And if it's going to trend higher, it just needs to seek buy side liquidity. And I'm trying my best to explain this, but I feel like for some reason it can be confusing when I tell people 
you should only be selling in a premium. You should be only buying at a discount. Yes, that is true. But for a certain extent, because the market needs to expand, it can't just go back and forth amongst the opening price. If this is the open, let's move this over. Let's say this line is the open. How can I hide this? I know I can hide this. Um, object tree. Hide the candles. There we go. If this is the opening price, and based on the ideology of selling in a premium and selling in a discount... If it was truly, you know, specifically cut down to exactly that, always selling a premium, always selling a discount. And when the market does it, it immediately does it. That means the market would always look like this. Now, we know that that's not how the market works. We know the market doesn't just stay range bound forever. Yes, we know there are some months that it does it. Like GU. GU was ranging around. CGU real quick. I know GU was ranging around. Nope. We need o Oanda. I want the Oanda. Daily. Take it off. Go to the opening price. There. GU was ranging back and forth. Because it's in a phase of consolidation. It's going to range eventually. It's in a phase of consolidation right now. And you can see how it's teeter-tottering behind, between the line. But that's not going to be the situation for every single asset class. And this is specifically to the trader that asked this question in the Telegram channel. Yes, you can see it comes back to fair value multiple times, the opening price. It, gets, it goes below the open, goes back to fair value. Now it's above the open. Now it gets back to fair value. Now it goes back to fair value. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. But when you're in a market that's trending, this is the only way I can answer this question, my friend. When the market is trending, it's going to leave fair value alone. It's not going to come back to it. It's inevitable. It's not going to get back to fair value. It's done with that. Let's go back, 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 back. It is going to be completely done with fair value. It's going to get out of that range of being in fair value. And this is US oil back here. It can't stay there forever. It just can't because this market wants to expand and breathe. For us to sit here and say that the market must go back to fair value or the opening price at this point would be unfair and would be very unrealistic of us as traders. It needs to trend. It needs to trend. It needs to trend. It cannot just always sell in a premium. It cannot always just buy in a discount. You are going to be forced to buy at higher prices. Notice here how I showed how to buy at a higher price. Wait for a down day. Buy limit at the close. Buy stop order at the open. Buy on weakness. Buy on strength. There you go. Profit. And then you can see how it trends. This is the same thing with swing trading. People ask me, what's my swing trading model? I'm showing it to you guys. I'm literally showing it to you guys with the day-to-day -day price action. I told you guys, I'm not trading. And then I find a setup, and I'm like, okay, I'm long. I'm looking to hold this for the next couple of days. I'm looking for the hold this for the next week, the next two weeks. Same thing here. This is a swing trade idea, guys. You would be able to hold this for one day, two days, three days. All with the idea of price still targeting swing high formations. Buy side liquidity. If the look back 20 day high. Significant level. Same thing with UJ. Notice here. How many times did we get a discount opportunity? Only one time. Very quick. The first day. Of this month, January 2nd, the open of the year, the first start of the month. So you see this December 29th, 
You move over. There you go. It moves into a discount one time. It's hard. To, it's hard to catch this, right? In hindsight, nobody would probably had caught that, unless they're using a different model or idea to catch a lower buy. But what would I have done? I would have had waited for a confirmation that price is going to continue to trend in a bullish in a in a premium range. What is that confirmation? Swing high broken, higher swing low. Right there, from this higher swing low, all you have to do is wait to be a buyer, guys. That was it. Now, people are probably just looking for more answers, you know? They want me to give them all the answers. I can't give you all the answers because I can't hold your hand every single day during the sessions and trade it for you. I could just give you some of the characteristics to what a bullish trend looks like and what to look for every day. Look to buy below midnight opening price. Look to buy below the Asian session open. Look to buy below New York open. Look to buy below New York open. Look to buy below the weekly open. Look to buy on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Let's see if you have any buying days on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. Wednesday, buying day. Good. Fr Thursday, no, not so much. Com comes down. Counter. Friday, we don't. Tr I don't trade Fridays as a day trade. No. Monday, runs up. Another Tuesday, buying. Another Wednesday, buying. How easy was that for me to tell you when to buy and when not to buy? What days to buy on? What days not to trade? Very simple idea. The only reason I'm able to say that is because I've been doing it for a while and I'm informed about the market. Yeah. What a night, man. That's it. <laughs> That's it, man. If you have any questions, please let me know in the chat. No problem. Hope you rest well, my friend. Yeah. Talked a lot. Normally after talking this long, I end up losing my voice and I can hear it. Yeah. Forensic Forex. That's me, man. That's me, man. Deontay. We, we, hey, like I said, we try our best on this side. I try my best for everybody. I can't help help everybody. I can't get to every single answer. I can't answer every DM. And I, I even though I do, I can't answer every text, even though I do anyways, or email. Um I even wake up out of my sleep, you know, when I hear my phone go off and I see somebody, I'm like, dang, I really love this, you know, and I really want to help people. So keep going. I'm proud of you guys, you know. Wherever you may be in the next year. Two years, three years, whatever the case may be. You know, I have I've had people be a part of the community for years. And then sooner or later, they said, Hey, I'm done with the channel. I think you taught me everything I, I could learn. And they exit. And I respect that too. Cause I've done the same thing too with ICT. I look I, I listened, I watched almost every single ICT video, all the free free YouTube stuff, went through the paid thing, rewatched everything again. I've done it all, and I think I've learned everything that it is to trading from ICT. And I don't, I don't watch any more ICT. I just don't, because I, I think I found enough value that I don't need to continue following. And that's where I want you guys to be, be, be as well. You know, I want you guys to find so much value that you're like Deontay. You know what? You did so much for me. And now I actually don't need your guidance anymore. You know what? I don't need to ask you any more questions anymore. You actually you actually summarize everything. And I'm coming to a point where I can spread my wings and fly. I don't need to be a part of the nest anymore. And that's what I, I want for everybody. You can't always stay at home. You know, I'm trying to say like I'm home for you guys, you know. You're going to eventually spread. You're going to grow wings and you're going to flap and you're going to fly. And you're going to do the same thing I'm showing you on a day-to-day -day basis too. And you're going to become your own great trader and your own self. So keep pushing forward, guys. I really want you guys to do better. Peace.